around the world today for this digital forum to highlight how restoration can support a healthy climate, economy, and planet. My name is Rosario Perez, and I will be your host for today. We have an exciting schedule, starting with our opening plenary, followed by three one-hour sessions, each bringing to our attention a key challenge and opportunity for forest and landscape restoration. Simultaneously, translations in English, French, and Spanish is available in Interaxio. Please find the link in the chat or below to live stream. If you're having trouble, please ask one of our chat moderators. In order to also hear from you, the audience, we'll be using the interactive digital tool Slido. So please have your mobile devices ready and go to slido.com, hashtag restore together. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Masunda Mumba, Vice Chair of the Collaborative Platform on Forests and Chair of Global Platform on Forest and Landscape Restoration to officially introduce this digital forum. Thank you so much, Rosaria. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, wherever you are in the world, greetings. I'm excited to be here. And my name is Musonda Mumba. I'm the director of the UNDP Rome Center for Sustainable Development, as Rosaria has said, and also chair of GPFLR and vice chair of CPF. And the fact that you've actually joined in and registered and come to this event, that means you're interested and you're doing something about restoration. So we want to know. So you were told about Slido. So if you're on Slido on your phone or your tablet or your, um, your computer, please go to Slido with hashtag restore together and respond to this question. And the question is, what does restoration mean for you? What does it mean for you? And I'll be looking at the responses uh, and talk about that. In the meantime, I'm absolutely excited to be here as your host and moderator. And we have amazing speakers for this panel. We have seen the challenges that the world has faced in the last few months. And really the realization, as we saw from that film, that with degradation comes a lot of problems, the loss of biodiversity, our very livelihoods, the very medicines that we've depended on for millennia, food systems, climate crisis, fueling violent, um, violent uh, crisis and, and, and all those problematic issues that we've, you know, we've actually experienced and people have experienced in different parts of the world. As such, this particular panel will be really looking to explore and talk about through this digital forum and introduce the Forest and Landscape Restoration Implementation Hub so without further ado, I would like to have a look at that screen on the Slido. If we can have a look at that. Wow, this is looking good. This is looking good. I see, bring back life, maximizing benefits, hope, hope. I love that someone has actually mentioned hope there, improvement, return to original state. I wonder what that original state is though. Hmm, now that's a big question and maybe some of our panelists will respond to that. Okay, what other question? The growth, uh -huh. healthy ecosystems. This is fantastic. Improvement again, community, community. How do we become responsible communities? This is absolutely exciting. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first video message that we're going to receive from His Excellency, State Secretary of the German Ministry of Environment, Nature, Conservation and Nuclear Safety, Minister Jochen Flashbach. And we have that five minute video that is going to stream shortly. Over, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the role of nature-based solutions in our efforts to tackle the climate and biodiversity crisis is receiving more and more political attention. For example, this topic is at the heart of discussions in the ongoing G20 preparations under UK presidency and in the COP26 preparations. I very much welcome these developments. However, we should not lose sight of our ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. We also have to ensure social and environmental integrity in the implementation of nature-based solutions. One of the most promising nature-based solutions that allows us to approach the climate and biodiversity crisis in a holistic way is the restoration of degraded ecosystems. Well-functioning ecosystems have direct benefits. They are important habitats 
indispensable carbon sinks and provide irreplaceable livelihoods for local bio-based economies. Those were the ideas which 10 years ago prompted our engagement in the bond challenge. What we now refer to as nature-based solutions were already incorporated into the Forest Landscape Restoration FLR approach, which lies in the heart of the bond challenge. This clear approach, mainly developed by IUCN, has provided clear proof of the success of restoration. Another remarkable feature of this approach is its universality. Forest landscape restoration can be applied to the mangrove forests in Indonesia as well as to the mountainous rainforests in Rwanda. It can be used for the shaded coffee forest in Ghana and an agroforest community in Guatemala. The beauty of FLR is also that it considers human beings and ecosystems as components of one single unit, which have to be well balanced. I see today's forum as a very good opportunity to share insights and perspectives on accelerating progress on forest and landscape restoration amongst FLR partners, and I applaud GLF for organizing this event. The process of restoration sends an urgently needed signal that after decades of overexploiting our ecosystems, we can reverse this trend with nature-based solutions. The restoration of ecosystems not only provides economic benefits, but also a vision that extends beyond individual disciplines, borders and interests. It restores not just our ecosystems, but also our future. We need this positive message to help spark the necessary transformational change to successfully implement the 2030 Agenda. This is an important reason why my ministry supports and continues to support initiatives like the Bond Challenge, the Global Landscape Forum and the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Together with IUCN and other partners and with the support of the International Climate Initiative, we have taken initial steps for developing an FLR restoration hub in Bonn. The project has not started yet, but we are joining forces to get the preparation phase underway very soon and hope to have a fully operational hub by the end of next year. This hub will give a major boost to the implementation of restoration activities that will in turn help us achieve the various targets set out for 2030. I wish you all here today fruitful and forward-looking discussions on ongoing and future restoration activities. Minister Flashbach, the importance of this positive message looking forward to 2030 and really accelerating action and also really bringing on board the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which is getting launched very soon in June. Very exciting. How do we not leave people behind? So exciting to have this FLR implementation hub that is going to be um, established and, and really sort of put into motion job creation, reducing threats to biodiversity, but also making sure that there's a complementarity between the adaptation and um, mitigation conversations as they happen through the Rio Convention on Climate Change, G7, G20, he refers to that, and also the other critical conventions, uh, the one on land, CCD, and also uh, biodiversity. Very important message. We have a fantastic panel of experts who are going to talk about the very subject of nature-based solutions under this topic, you know, on actually what does restoration mean for you and how do we really enhance activity? The first speaker, so I've got a, three, a set of three speakers. The first is going to be Bruno Orbele, who's the Director General of IUCN. And the next speaker is going to be Fran um, Price, from, who's the Forest Practice Lead um, for WWF, the World, uh, World Wildlife Fund uh, Organization. And the last speaker on this panel, lastly but not the least, of course, is Manish Bhopna, Acting President and CEO of the World Resources Institute. Welcome to all three of you. Fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much for coming, um, seeing familiar faces. I want to start with Bruno. You listened to um, Minister Flasbach's um, message there, and really he talks about the, the, you know, the challenge the world has found itself in, particularly that this global catastrophe, um, I mean, in present history, this is since the World War, uh, the Second World War, we've, we're in a crisis, a tremendous and problematic crisis. There are real risks to, to, to obviously the way we knew life, as it were. And also there's a danger that 
um, as we kind of see improvements, people are hearing about vaccinations and they're thinking, oh, we can go back to the old life and go back to normal. But then it begs the question, what is needed to ensure that nature-based solutions, particularly restoration in particular, is prior prioritized? And what, you know, what opportunities should we seize in building back or building forward better, depending on the lens that you're viewing it from? Over to you, Bruno. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, um, uh, my best greetings to all the people that is engaging in, that, in, the, in this dialogue. Um, it's great to be here. Yeah, this is something that we, it, 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 it's uh, occupying our minds, right? We are in the full in the pandemic. We see in some part of the world uh, light at the end of the tunnel in other country, uh, less uh, sadly, um, but we have to reflect about uh, what it is, uh, what it is bringing to us in terms of, uh, of understanding of the situation. The pandemic has not changed completely the reality. It was already, uh, previous to the pandemics, um, that, uh, for example, to put it in the word of the of the of the Skupta's review, that uh, um, that that our societies and our economies are fully embedded in nature, that we we use uh, nature uh, for all our needs, that we overuse um, the, the the amount of nature that we have. Um, for, for our society that we are de that we are diminishing the reserves and the capacity of nature to uh, regenerate and we are not reinvesting into the natural capital so uh, we use too much and we don't rebuild and this is of course it is uh, like you you have an account in the bank and you take and take and take and you too much and you never put in so at one moment you will run out of money and at one moment we will run out of nature and this will be a catastrophe much much bigger catastrophe than to run out um, of money uh, we we have to remember that uh, a lot of our needs fundamental needs food uh, air water are relying, relying on, on natural processes and are relying on the work of the biodiversity and relying on, on, on nature. Now, um, we, we, have, we have to learn to, uh, uh, to take less and to reinvest. We have captured from, the, from these one and a half years uh, how important commons are and how far we can reach if we engage all together. And this is what we should do now uh, also for nature. Uh, IUCN has launched an initiative, uh, nature-based uh, nature -based recovery initiative. We want uh, uh, states, um, startup actors, societies to start, to, to restart our economies, but to restart it better than it was previously. We are, we, we are investing a lot of money in our economies. So far, we have counted uh, up to 17,000 billion US dollar that are put in our economies. And we would, we would this money to be invested in a way that it is not contributing to the depleting, to the, to depleting and further depleting, depleting nature. On the other side, we want a substantial part of that, of that money to be spent in a way that it recreates natural capital. The two elements we said, we said before, we should stop taking too much and we should reinvest. And this is what we can learn to do with these recovery packages, building back, but better, building back than greener, respecting, respecting nature. And of course, restoring nature is one fundamental way where we could put money in, invest in restoring um, the, the, the natural machine, invest in nature and you will get a better life as a dividend. I absolutely liked your bank analogy, you know, because we are over, you know, taking out, taking out and not replenishing. It's problematic. Great to hear about this initiative, uh, the Nature Based Solutions Recovery Initiative. This is fantastic to really get um, action. And thank you for your reference to the Das Gupta report on our dependence on nature. Um, Manisha, I want to turn to you. Um, 
given the, the increasing recognition and support for restoration in addressing these you know, global challenges as we see them and as we've experienced them um, and meeting obviously the national development uh, priorities, why aren't we doing more of this and, 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 and really having these actions as, as Bruno has mentioned? What are some of the critical implementation challenges and how can we overcome these challenges as it were? Great, thank you, Musanda, and a privilege to be here with all of you. I, I really wanted to underscore Bruno's points, uh, both the point that the pandemic didn't break the world, but reveal the world that already was broken. Um, and I really love the image of the bank account. So I'm gonna give you another image. Think of a jigsaw puzzle. And I think part of the challenge we have with implementation around forest and landscape restoration specifically, or nature-based solutions more generally, we tend to focus on individual pieces of what it takes to actually create a more inclusive and more sustainable restoration, nature-based solutions. We tend to look at individual pieces. And part of the problem is no one is looking and recognizing that multiple things have to happen at the same time. So when you think about a jigsaw puzzle, I just want to pick out three pieces that I think haven't gotten that much attention in the past and why I think this effort that we're launching today is so incredibly exciting and important. The first is just the importance of building adequate local capacity. That if we want truly an inclusive approach to landscape restoration, we need to invest in those local champions, the entrepreneurs, the local financial institutions, the local governments that are gonna be on the front lines of building out that restoration. And a part of that challenge is also creating the technical capacity to develop more bankable projects. So looking at both local capacity of local communities, of lo entrepreneurs, local governments, kind of one piece of the puzzle that doesn't get much attention. The second piece is working with governments and the technical capacity to help build projects that are able to attract financing at scale. What we have oftentimes now, finally, some fairly significant interest from large public financial institutions, from large private financial institutions to help support investing in restoration, but how to actually design projects that meet the finance where that is, getting that investment readiness, that bankable projects is the second piece of the puzzle where more investment needs to be made. And the third kind of piece is just the enabling policy environment. All too often, I remember working on landscape restoration over 20 years ago in India, and we did this multi-state study looking at why did landscape restoration take off in some states so effectively, but not in others. Thinking about tenure arrangements, thinking about benefit sharing arrangements, thinking about the incentives that local communities to have to trade and recoup the revenues from products generated through landscape restoration, those things matter. And finally, a piece also is around monitoring, making sure we understand how, what is happening in terms of restoration. So these are just some pieces of the puzzle that I think are quite important for us to get right. And what is quite exciting is this hub, this forest and landscape restoration hub that we're launching is focusing on many of these pieces that have not gotten the attention that they deserved over the years. So that's why today is so exciting. No, thank you, Manish. I, I love the, the jigsaw pieces. And, and in reality, for you to be able to see the picture better, the pieces have to come together. And looking at the system as a whole, unfortunately, we've looked at this in a very sort of you know, piecemeal approach, as you have said. And, and this is really great tenure, benefit sharing, monitoring, enabling policy environment. This is absolutely fantastic. And also hearing about, you know, governance issues, capacity level and entrepreneurship. It's really incredible that we're beginning to see that sort of emerging now, um, but there's still a lot of work to do. So I'm turning now to Fran. Fran, you know, WWF, I, I enjoyed my time when I worked for WWF. At the country level, you have such incredible experiences where you've seen good progress around, you know, restoration, particularly restoring of degraded um, landscapes and deforested lands, Costa Rica, Rwanda, Pakistan, in Malawi. Um, what do you see as the key factors underlying the successes? Thank you, Masanda, and um, it's it it really is a privilege to be here with you all today, talking about this absolutely critical issue. 
And, you know, when we look at what has been successful um, and with forest landscape restoration, and as you mentioned, Musanda, uh, WWF has been working at this um, along with partners like IUCN and WRI for decades now. Um, but many of the elements are those puzzle pieces that Manish uh, mentioned, um, that community engagement and governance uh, systems and models that are as close to the ground as possible, that really um, enable um, ownership over restoration work and, and the benefits uh, that, uh, that come uh, from that work, that this work that's really tailored to the local context. Um, and that um, community engagement ownership is, is absolutely key. Um, from what we what we've seen in terms of success, um, private sector uh, engagement and and public private partnerships, which are really able to um, mobilize capital, which are able to bring investors and finance. Um, project developers um, who are able to bring uh, capacity building and technical assistance, as uh, Manish mentioned, and, um, and help with readiness work. Um, and then businesses whose supply chains land in uh, given landscapes, uh, and either for uh, because of their leadership commitments or because of their business models, um, there are many who are getting engaged in restoration and who have been engaged in restoration because of those commitments and because uh, restoration is part of the, the model. Um, and as Manish mentioned, also those policy frameworks that enable forest landscape restoration and tenure rights are at the heart of uh, those, those frameworks that are needed and that have worked. Um, because without rights recognition, you can't have long-term restoration. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and we also need long-term policy commitments because restoration is a long-term endeavor. Commitments that go beyond political cycles. And we need uh, that long-term financing as well, because um, you know this is this is not just about a one-time uh, tree planting effort. It's it's a long-term effort, and we need the appropriate incentives and disincentives, like payments for ecosystem services, like tax breaks, et cetera. So there are a variety of things that have worked in the in the countries that you mentioned. And uh, another thing that I will emphasize um, is. Uh, the institutional infrastructure that needs to be in place to help uh, with capacity building, to help with delivery of forest landscape restoration. And, and that also needs to be there for the long term. And then finally, uh, again, what Manish mentioned is, is monitoring. To not only understand the baseline from where you start, but to track progress over time and to uh, enable you to make adjustments if needed um, in your efforts. So those are some of the key factors that we've seen in those countries um, where we and our partners have been working for so long. Thank you. No, thank you so much. I'm actually reading a fantastic book by Roman uh, Krisnari called The Good Ancestor. And he talks exactly about how you stated that, you know, how can we have this long-term policy commitments, long-term thinking, um, and avoid this short-termism, which is, of course, in a lot of political uh, systems have been designed around. How do we rethink this future? And, and you really touch on these elements, you know, payment for ecosystem services and all of that, um, which I find very interesting and quite important for also that readiness and for things to happen on the ground. I like the PPP, you know, private public partnerships, which also feeds into what also the theme for the G20 is, you know, focusing on people, planet and prosperity. How do we have that element of convergence? This is absolutely uh, fantastic. Now, thank you so much for that, Fran. Bruno, I want to come back to you. Um, Minister Flashbach mentioned in his intervention, in his speech, um, and made reference to the Bonn Challenge. Uh, and I know that IUCN obviously has, has been um, you know, responsible for it. How has the initiative as the Bonn Challenge really helped to build awareness 
support and political will for restoration and what experiences can we learn from the bond challenge as we now embark on this you know incredible journey with the un decade on ecosystem restoration over to you um, i mean to to as my nation fran has, has already also explained we need we need uh, to speed up our engagement for nature uh, in the restore in, in in the in the uh, in the end uh, in coming out from the pandemic and then afterwards uh, continuing uh, investing into our natural capital we need we need sound knowledge we need uh, we need uh, political will we need uh, capacity funding uh, private sector and we need inspiration uh, and uh, there is, there is a, a number of of um, of sources of inspiration in, in, that came to my mind. Now, one is uh, um, is really what is happening in the in the in the climate sector. We have learned so much from the from the climate debate. Um, how how to how to bring uh, the the climate risks into a finance a finance discussion. How to uh, to engage with the private sector displaying to their eyes the uh, opportunities that uh, such a, transform a transformation of societies and production and consumption pattern would uh, would uh, uh, would disclose for them and uh, and 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 uh, how we we were able to create uh, uh, so kind of uh, pilot of of engagement to to inspire and learn in in our sector um, the bond challenge uh, is one of such of such pilots. We have countries uh, and other entities that have pledged to restore over 200 million hectares of degraded land, and this is, uh, is, is is something that it was going over the expectation, and uh, uh, we have to take this uh, readiness to uh, to to engage. Politically, on the on the, on the, on the on the issue of restoring land, land, land forest and landscape as, as an inspiration, uh, as as Frank was mentioning, this is it is it is a long term uh, a long term endeavor. The uh, um, let's say the the the, uh, the pledge is the starting point of a very long process of implementation, but it is a very important important starting point. Uh, the bond challenge and, and the ways in, we, in which it was brought to, to countries and private sector is one source of the of inspiration for this uh, for this work. This is absolutely fantastic. I like that you actually bring the word inspiration, which also came up in the word cloud when we just started on Slido. We need to be inspired and also back to the jigsaw puzzles, how these pieces come together and how we have to make sure that um, you know, we connect to other different sectors in the climate sector as an inspiration. Thank you for that. I want to turn to you, Manish. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm around planting of trees you know here this one there's a million over there and another billion and so many numbers and people out there and then all of a sudden we just don't hear about it but in in many people's mind they think that when they hear the word restoration it just really means we need more trees and there's some element of confusion there but restoration encompasses more than planting trees obviously and it covers you know productive landscapes coastal grasslands urban you know spaces and much more and, and really much wider. So how can we reach out and build a more deeper and, and wider coalition of restoration champions, uh, but also investors and participation to see that restoration is really key to their work and interests in, in what they do on an everyday basis? You know, it's, uh, it's a great question. And I, I, I think the enthusiasm for tree planting uh, and for restoration is, is, is you know, I, I haven't seen enthusiasm like this in the last 20 years, and much of it, much of it is in no small part uh, through a climate lens. I think the momentum around climate has created an incredible amount of interest in landscape restoration or tree planting more specifically. And so this is this is quite an important moment. It's kind of almost a once in a generation moment because if that money is not programmed well. It can be an incredibly wasted opportunity. When you look at the issues that both Fran and Bruno mentioned, 
to do this right is not easy. And there's a concern a little bit that money that isn't spent and thoughtfully on those kind of institutional, local capacity, governance, policy-related issues, we're not going to get where we need to go. So just three quick thoughts on, on your question. One, start with people. Landscape restoration is not about trees. It's, you have to start with people. All of our institutions, we, we just spent 18 months in one district, Siddhi, in Madhya Pradesh, in India, doing active consultation, generating bottom-up plans of how they want to think about restoring landscapes in that small little district. Start with people. Second, it's about the right trees in the right places. There is a, a kind of a, a real, I, I remember in the 1970s, there was a tree shrub um, called mesquite in Mexico that was introduced in Kenya and had quite significant negative implications. It was so favorable to grow in Kenya, it wiped out all the native vegetation. Need to think hard about native species, right trees, right places. But as you said also, the third point, it's much more than just trees. It's about how we restore grasslands. It's about how we restore peatlands. Those non-tree related restoration opportunities aren't getting the same attention that they deserve. We need more data. We need more stories. We need to demonstrate the role and the importance of those other ecosystems to a healthy climate, a healthy economy, a healthy planet. After all, this isn't the decade of tree planting. It's the decade of ecosystem restoration. Thank you. It is not the decade of tree planting, as you're all listening. It is the decade of ecosystem restoration, ecosystems, as it were. Fran, I come to you um, last now. So how do you see restoration in your mind sort of fitting alongside other solutions, particularly addressing the global challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, and also the element of COVID recovery, alongside, say, you know, transportation, energy production, and expansion? of protected areas um, and also increased spending on health. The fact that, you know, we've been affected um, with our health with this pandemic. How do you see that in your mind? Thank you, Lucinda. It's a great question. So um, as we look collectively at the challenges that face us and um, we, we know that there are certain things that we need to do, um, but restoration is a key tool in the toolbox. Alongside the clear mandates around reducing emissions and decarbonizing our economies, in parallel and just as urgently, we need to be addressing the loss of nature. And um, we need to be looking at nature-based solutions, which can provide 30% of, of climate mitigation opportunities. Um, and from a forest perspective, there are um, four pathways um, within those nature-based solutions. One is stopping deforestation and conversion. One is preserving uh, the forest sink. So the, you know, the forest carbon sink. Uh, another is improving uh, the way we manage forests. Um, and the fourth is restoration. And restoration is actually the second largest mitigation pathway when we think about those nature-based solutions. Because even if we stopped deforesting and converting our habitats today, we would not have enough forests to be our allies in the fight against climate change in the fight against nature loss. So we desperately need to accelerate restoration. Um, I was looking at some numbers preparing for this talk um, and our tracking uh, to progress under the New York Declaration um, has actually showed that restoration efforts have slowed in the last 10 years. So before 2011, we were averaging 2 million hectares a year. Post 2011, we've been averaging a million hectares a year. So we are, it, we're beyond uh, at an urgent point here. Um, but what is so exciting is, you know, we're entering the UN decade. Um, we are, uh, creating partnerships around implementation 
um, like the implementation facility uh, or hub uh, that all, all three of us speakers, um, our organizations are working on with uh, the German government and, and other partners. So there's, there's some um, incredible opportunities here, um, but the urgency is, um, is beyond belief at this point. Thank you. No, thank you so very much, Fran. You know, really, you highlight the importance of tracking and the fact that, you know, we, we just, we're not staying on course and we need to really stay on course going forward. I really want to sincerely thank you all three, Fran, Manish, and Bruno, for your amazing and great interventions. And I just want to, you know, really um, acknowledge and thank the audience for joining us and also just highlight that, you know, this Forest Landscape Restoration Hub is also your hub. You know, you have to be a part of it. You have to be engaged. This is going to be one of the shining stars in the universe of the, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And we're really hoping that it will be, you know, have several flagship initiatives. And then in its implementation, it's looking at on-ground activities. What can we see on the ground, the change supporting communities so that we see impact and also we see change, really tangible change. Um, this FLR implementation hub is also going to be, um, you know, some kind of global concept in responding to financing mechanisms. How can it support countries? How can it respond to different elements of forest restoration? And also more importantly, how do we bring conversations and community? We saw that element of community um, in the cloud, which was really, really fantastic. So the focus will be threefold. It will be really looking at investment preparedness. It will be looking at capacity development to also be looking at private sector mobilization and engagement. And really, even though it hasn't started, really we have planted the seed and action will begin. So I really want to thank you for being a part of this journey and for really listening in. And please look out for all the information, be it on Twitter, be it on all the social media sites, on the websites of the organizations that are represented here, IUCN, um, WRI, and WWF. Look out for this information, and there's a lot that we can do together going forward. Thank you so much, everyone, and wishing you a lovely and pleasant day ahead. Join in to the next sessions that are going to be happening. It's going to be exciting. Have a fun day, and all the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you thank so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. What a fantastic start to our digital forum. It's so beautiful to hear, um, at least from what I'm able to gather, the importance of the human engagement and restoration and how important it is that we are intentional with how we do things. So really beautiful points. A big welcome to those who have just joined us. My name is Rosario, and I'm your host for today. And we are discussing approaches to scaling up forest and landscape restoration to address climate change, create jobs, and conserve biodiversity. Up next for our first session of the forum, Fighting Climate Change Through Resilient Forests and Landscape Restoration. It is my pleasure to introduce Peter Benang, Principal Scientist at the World Agroforestry Center. Yes, Peter. 
Yeah, okay, good. Welcome, George. Welcome. Now we have everyone. I think we we can start. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are on the globe. Welcome to this session. Um, our session this uh, afternoon. I yeah, I'm already in the main room with, uh, with, uh, me, uh, with my video. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, welcome, George. Um, so we, we'll start. Um, our session is about nature-based solutions and how we can restore and support healthy, you know, climate and economies with uh, uh, restoration uh, uh, and, and nature-based solutions. The, the main objective here is to really look at how can uh, uh, forest landscape restoration really support climate change and support uh, climate smart uh, uh, activities and green economies uh, in, in, in one way or another. And to talk about that today, we've got um, quite a good uh, set of, of panelists, uh, very experienced people, people that I've known for quite a while. Uh, and, and I'll just introduce them uh, one after the other. So we've got Susan cook -Parton who's a senior forest uh, restoration scientist at the Nature Conservancy, uh, and who will be talking about the mitigation potential for FLR at global scale. Susan, can you just show, indicate, please? Hi, yeah, Susan, welcome. Um, we've got uh, one of our very uh, um, senior scientists uh, from C4, Huria, Judy. Uh, who would be talking to us today about, you know, uh, adaptation and mitigation synergies and how those can uh, uh, relate to biodiversity and also some implementation context in the Sahel uh, and, and touching on gender issues as well. Huria, can you switch on and, 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 and wave, please? Huria, okay. Um, okay, I'm, I mean, you get to see Huria when it's our time to talk. Um, third on our list, we've got Tor Wagen, uh, who's a senior scientist from ECAF, World Agroforestry Centre, who's going to be talking to us about tracking progress uh, towards national, nationally determined contributions um, and, and also how we link that to practice on the ground. Tor, can you just indicate to show of a hand? Yeah, good, good. Tor is here with us. Thanks. We've also got really uh, um, um, one of the most uh, well-known people on, on the green, uh, Great Green Wall, uh, Dr. Paul Elvis Tangem, who's uh, the coordinator uh, of the, the Great Green Wall at the African Union. Paul is very, Elvis is very experienced actually uh, uh, from a long time ago, like 25 years ago, I, I, I got to meet him uh, and, and he's working on a number of things uh, uh, up to this point, but really, really leading the work on the Great Green Wall. Paul, can you show, indicate please, wave to everyone, welcome, thanks for joining us. Also, we have another giant on the African continent, also um, someone who's been working on climate change for a long time. Uh, and the team leader for the African group of uh, negotiators, expert support, Agnes, uh, Dr. George Wamukoya. Um, George, can you show, indicate? Yes, please. Thanks, George, for joining us. Um, George Thanks, has Peter. worked a lot on climate change issues and really at the forefront of negotiations uh, and supporting, really leading the African group of negotiators technically on, on a number of issues. So we are Grateful to have this very, very, very uh, uh, great panel with us. Um, uh, we also have a really good team behind the event. Also, uh, Dr. Amy Duchel of C4, who's been leading the, 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 the coordination of the event also uh, in the background and a great technical team that will be supporting this. Uh, um, so we, we are looking forward to a great event. We've now got... Um, can see um, a number of people online. We need to double check how many more we are getting online. Quite a number, I guess. Um, I can't read the number exactly, but but we'll 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 ride on uh, and 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 see 
uh, how we get how we get questions and, and comments. You can also link up to if you go to the live feeds of the event online, you will also see uh, you can post your comments. You can uh, uh, ask questions as well, and we'll be turning to that uh, in the process as well uh, as we move on. I don't know if if uh, uh, someone, Wigid or Adinda, wanted to brief us all on how we can the audience can put some questions up or something like that. Adinda, did you want to brief on, on how we can, how people can interact? Thanks, Peter. Our, our colleagues will add instructions in the chat room, but um, otherwise, feel, please feel free to, to start the session. Okay, great. Okay, good. So we, let, let's go, let's kick off with uh, Susan. Uh, starting off, off with her presentation, looking at the potential for uh, um, uh, forest landscape restoration contributing to climate change globally. Great, thank six you. Minutes, six minutes, Suzanne, please take it away. All right, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be speaking on this panel with so many illustrious figures and to speak with all of you out there. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on our work. So if you go to the next slide, um, my work focuses on figuring out how we can restore forest cover as a natural climate solution. And next slide, please. And restoration of forest cover is a really potentially powerful climate solution. We estimate up to sort of eight to 10 uh, petagrams of CO2 per year could be removed if we were able to deploy this at very large scales. Um, but the things that I want to mention are that it does require changes in land use, and it can be expensive compared to other natural climate solutions. Um, so there is definitely a need to try to figure out how can we best deploy this in the places that are likely to have the largest climate return per hectare of investment. Um, and it's also important to note that climate mitigation potential is going to vary by location. You know, are you in a dry tropical forest versus a wet tropical forest, as well as the approach for restoring forest cover, which I'll talk about more. So my work focuses on trying to develop robust maps of carbon accumulation rates that show how mitigation potential varies across the landscape and by approach for getting trees back into the landscape. Next slide. Uh, to do this work, we realize that there's a lot of information out there. It's just scattered across so many different publications and reports that the people who need the information aren't able to access it readily. So we decided to do that for people and started by scanning over 11,000 publications and read about 5,400 that seemed to fit the bill. And finally found about 1,400 papers that quantified carbon stocks in recovering forests. Um, and had a known stand age, so we could estimate carbon accumulation rates. We focus first on that. All right, are good? Yes, okay. We focus first on natural forest regrowth, which is the recovery of forest um, on cleared lands through spontaneous uh, forest growth without doing anything to plant or, or help the system to recover. Um, because people have decided to stop whatever the previous disturbance was. But there are other forms uh, of reforestation or ways to, to get forest cover back, such as actively planting or setting up a monoculture and diverse timber plantation. And we're working with folks to characterize the carbon signature of those practices. And I also wanted to flag that we are trying to compile the agroforestry literature as well, uh, but we're just starting. So I'd love to hear from people if you have good data that we might be able to use as well. Next slide. So for natural forest regrowth, we compiled over 13,000 field points uh, from the literature, which are shown in blue dots here, as well as from national inventories in the US, Sweden, and Australia. And then we compiled that with 66 global covariate layers of uh, variables like climate, soil, nutrient chemical properties, et cetera, and used that to uh, predict potential carbon accumulation rates across all forest and savanna biomes for places where we didn't have field data. Next slide. And this is the results. 
Uh, it's a one kilometer map that any of you can use. Um, I think the most important take home is that we see over a hundred fold variation in carbon accumulation rates across the globe. So if you look at the legend, it goes from 0 0.06 tons of carbon per hectare per year up to six tons of carbon per hectare per year. So you can use this to estimate the mitigation potential for natural forest regrowth in any location, um, but you can also use it to target the places within a country or landscape that have the highest potential returns uh, per hectare of investment. Um, and that's it for me. So thank you for the opportunity to share our work and I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the talks. Great, thanks a lot. Thanks, really, really brief, uh, uh, um, Suzanne. Really good, we're good on time, I think. Um, we've got uh, 140 people online now, so um, um, quite a number of people following, and the number keeps growing. So please uh, tune in and, and please keep keep your comments coming and your questions. We we'll, we won't take questions now. We'll wait until the end of all of the series of presentations, and then we'll come back to the questions. So let's just uh, move on with uh, our second presenter, uh, Huria Judy. Please. Take it away. Kuria, can you go? Yes, okay, good. Thanks. Um, we, uh, can, we can't hear you, Huria. Please try to unmute. Oh, we seem to have problems with Huria. Huria, can you hear? Yeah, it seems to unmute and then mute, mute on, mute again, on on your screen. Hello. Now we've got we've got a, a little technical hitch with uh, Huria's link there. Um, so maybe uh, in the meantime, Huria, as you're doing this, can we uh, we get? Is it possible to get Tor? Yeah, Tor. Can you can you start off, and then we'll yeah. come back to Huria, please. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah. I hope you can hear me. Uh, you yes, can just go no, to the no. you can just go to the next slide, uh, Vijit. So uh, basically, um, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, how we our work around linking uh, on the ground monitoring with global models, and so basically uh, building um, this talk around the the work we've been doing over the last uh, uh, fifteen years now in establishing data driven networks uh, across uh, the global tropics. Um, to basically assess um, and monitor uh, land degradation, soil and land health, and track land restoration on the ground. So this work is building um, around, uh, built around the, the use of the land degradation surveillance framework or the LDSF, which uh, you can see uh, the site locations there in that map at the bottom of the slide to the left. And basically using a combination of data collected in the field uh, remote sensing and increasingly uh, citizen science as well using things like mobile phone apps that we're developing as well. So with this work we're basically looking at a number of different indicators that are really important around land restoration and FLR um, because at the end of the day when we're talking about FLR it, we're not just talking about uh, vegetation cover or forest cover. There's a lot of other uh, indicators that we need to be looking at and uh, we need to be tracking over time, uh, including uh, processes of land degradation, for example, soil erosion prevalence, which is a very important problem across the global tropics and globally uh, generally. Uh, we also look at soil properties, uh, soil hydrology, land management, of course, or land use. And then there's, of course, vegetation cover, but looking beyond just vegetation cover also at biodiversity. So with all these different dimensions of, of um, land health uh, and, and land restoration, um, we've, we've been 
we've come a long way in the last uh, few years now in terms of being able to track this in a systematic way and at scales that are relevant for uh, various types of decision makers and stakeholders. And next slide. So this um, is just an example that I put together and this I could have pulled this for anywhere basically uh, across the global tropics, but this is an example for Ghana. Um, looking at um, soil organic carbon for the whole country on the right there. Uh, just showing a map where low carbon systems are basically yellow in color and the, the, the brown colors indicate higher carbon. So you can see the higher carbon in, in the sort of forest cocoa mosaics that we have in Ghana in the southern, southern part and especially in the southwest. And then lower carbon as we go higher up towards the sort of the Sahel and the, the drier parts of the country. Um, but what's really important here is that we can do this nationally. And of course, we could then aggregate these types of metrics. And this is just one example of one indicator. Uh, we can aggregate that nat nationally. But with these uh, approaches and with the, the tools that we have, we can also go down in much more detail, as shown here on the left, uh, just as an example. And um, where you can look at, uh, at uh, spatial resolution down to 10 to 30 meters and look at sort of farm level assessments of these indicators. So in a, in a sense, we're able to bridge the different, scale, different scales from local to national and regional, which is really important for FLR. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Tor. Really good, really brief. Um, you can see that we, we are really, with Susan and Tor, we are working on really nice tools. I, I saw some people asking online whether Susan can provide some links to the tools. So I hope we can do that on the, on the, on the, on the conference site uh, uh, for the event as well, so that people can access those. Um, uh, our next speaker, Huria, um, are we ready? Hello? Hello? Huri, are you ready? Huria, are you ready to go? Uh, Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank please you. Please just I'm go using, ahead. Yeah. I'm using my phone now. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. please. Well <laughs> done. <laughs> we can hear you. Yes, please go ahead. So yeah, hello everyone. I am very happy to be here and sorry for this uh, little technical problem. Uh, today, I would like to share some insight from our work in Burkina Faso, where we can show how the importance of the link between mitigation and uh, adaptation and uh, biodiversity in the dryland. Next slide, please. So this case study actually is a case study we did uh, in collaboration with uh, other um, partners. Uh, NGOs like Tipalga, who were actually having some uh, restoration initiatives already there. And we wanted to understand, okay, what is the potential those initiatives are bringing in terms of adaptation? Because what we see is a lot of discussions in terms of FNR is about mitigation, but there is not so much about uh, adaptation happening there. So what we did, we looked at the existing initiatives and then we ask the questions, what are their contributions in terms of adaptation? So we calculated what we call an index, an index on adaptive capacity. Uh, and we compared plantations, forest plantations, uh, restoration mm -hmm. through uh, protections, uh, and all of them are small scale uh, initiatives actually. And we, uh, in this adaptive capacity index, we looked at how much of the, the safety net role these uh, different initiatives can play, uh, what is the, the, their availability in terms of seasonality during the year to cover the needs of people 
people in terms of adaptation. Then we added to that some gender specific aspects, like for instance, what is the share of income coming from the ecosystem services from these initiatives, which is used by men or by women. So the good news I can tell you is that there is a possibility, of course, we measured carbon, that is the mitigation part. And uh, the good news is it is possible actually to avoid both environmental and social trade-offs between adaptation and mitigation. And here biodiversity is key. Please, next slide. So here I'm just taking two examples because I don't have so much time. And I'm looking at two different uh, 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 initiatives uh, which were uh, a part of the study. And one of them is the forest plantations, and the other one is the protection, protection uh, of degraded land and is like restored through natural regeneration. And uh, what we see here is actually in terms of carbon, there is not a very, very big difference between the two of them. But then when we add our index, the, the adaptive capacity index and the gender index, we see that there is actually a, a huge difference between uh, the two of them. Why is this difference in terms of their contribution to adaptation? I uh, gave some examples here in, the, in this slide. And I think here I need to highlight explicitly that the biodiversity part is a very, very important part. What we see is in the forest plantation, for instance, the number of actors who are using these specific areas decreases and it's not so high. And I give you an example here, for instance, pastoralists. If you put a forest plantation, it is more likely that you cannot put animals in the area. While in the protection, you can uh, collect fodder and sell to the pastoralist or the pastoralist can get in with the animals when the trees are, are higher. Uh, the, here we see that actually the biodiversity is completely and strongly linked to the social diversity, to the diversity of actors who are using this, uh, this area and who are benefiting from the ecosystem services. The second uh, point, which is more gender related, is that the income generated in the forest uh, plantations is mostly in the context of the Sahel managed by men. While if we look at the, at the protection, we see that uh, there are a lot of trees who are uh, growing in the, in the restoration areas, which can be completely, the income completely managed by women, like for instance, the shea trees or the parquet trees. Uh, another aspect which is uh, also important is the food security and the direct consumption, which is of course given in the protected areas and not directly given in the, in the forest plantations. So here we have the link between biodiversity and food security and adaptation, because what we, we have found is that a lot of the, the ecosystem services coming from the protected areas of, uh, in this case, are sold to buy food when there is a hardship, or they are consumed directly, few of them are consumed directly, so women collect a lot of this uh, uh, tree product for the local uh, food consumption. So here there is a link between biodiversity, gender, and adaptation. Next slide, please. So when we look at the adaptation mitigation uh, linkages, uh, they are extremely important in, in the dryland. And we see here that a lot of it is related to the diversity of users, the diversity of factors, and that we can actually, by choosing the right way of, of uh, restoring, benefit more from this adaptive capacity uh, potential, some uh, measures will offer and other will not. So here we are deciding actually when we do intervene in terms of FLR, we are deciding do we want to be inclusive? Are we including different actors like pastoralists, youth, women, or are we excluding? If we are excluding, what is then the solution for those other actors? And we need to think about winning more and losing less. 
the two other points I want really to highlight here is like in, in the Sahel at least, when we think about uh, trees in the landscape, they are not just, you know, trees being there and we can uh, replace them with different trees. Those trees actually are embedded in a very uh, deep and old system of knowledge, values, and identities. And here, the FLR logic of intervention needs a paradigm shift to integrate a bit more of that. Like when I, I was in Algeria, I thought that we had a very complex system in terms of land tenure. Then I arrived to the Sahel and then I was like absolutely amazed how fine-tuned the, the tree tenure and the land tenure are there between different ethnic groups, between different uh, genders. So here we have really to give attention, more attention to mm -hmm. those aspects. Mm -hmm. So I would say that there is a very urgent need to integrate adaptation mitigation and biodiversity as the three most important pillars of successful and just restoration. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Muria. Really, 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 really insightful, insightful uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. So, without wasting uh, much time, we'll give a chance to Elvis at this point. Elvis, you want to tell us how all of this is connected within the Great Green Wall? Yes, thank you very much, Peter. Thanks uh, for the invitation and happy to, to, to meet you again. Yeah, so um, as far as, uh, uh, I mean, great presentations there from our colleagues, you know, and uh, 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 excellent presentations about the, the uh, adaptation and uh, mitigation. Uh, but all of this would only work, uh, Peter, if uh, mm -hmm. these uh, ideas, these approaches are adopted by policymakers. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, we must uh, uh, ensure that whatever we are doing, the policymakers uh, at the at, at, are also at the forefront of all of this. And 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 uh, when we look at our current state, uh, I mean, we are talking about uh, the devastation of COVID. There is a, an urgent need that we look for for real long-term solutions to to both the to socio-economic and environmental uh, challenges. And nature-based solutions has proven to be um, uh, some of the 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 real and and long-term uh, uh, sustainable uh, solutions to provide sustainable solutions. And I and I think uh, it was. Uh, uh, this um, realization that uh, so uh, natural beings are real Sahel and in the dry lands of Africa of, of the continent came to be called the Great Green War for the Sahara and Sahel Initiative, uh, which. Uh, today has become a cornerstone program for sustainable land management of restoration and a building resilience to climate change uh, in, in the drylands of Africa. And here we are talking about some of uh, the regions that are most uh, vulnerable uh, to issues of climate change and, and uh, especially land degradation and desertification. Uh, and so the Good Green World was born out of the need to promote nature-based solutions to uh, the challenges that these uh, areas were facing. And uh, uh, so far, the, the program has been, uh, is currently being implemented in, in about 21 uh, member states of the Africa Union. And uh, since 2015, Peter, it would be good uh, to, to inform our stakeholders that we are working with the Southern Africa uh, uh, development communities uh, mm. for the extension of the Great Green Wall approach uh, to the drylands of uh, the Southern Africa region. And here uh, we talk about countries uh, around the Kalahari, the, the Namib, uh, and the Miombo uh, uh, savanna uh, uh, areas. These are also uh, countries that have, have been uh, seriously impacted by drought and uh, desertification. And so we have been working uh, with all the, 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 the 15, 16 countries in this region uh, for the um, uh, upscaling 
of the good green wall approach to, uh, to the region. Um, and so as we are talking about nature-based solution, talking about uh, the role of restoration uh, in, in a, a, a global climate health, the Great Green Wall is what I call the best case scenario, the best example on how um, policymakers, uh, policy uh, development uh, practitioners, international development organizations, uh, uh, non-research uh, 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 research institutions and, and non-state actors have been able to come together to create something together and uh, and uh, despite the initial challenges and the uh, uh, initial skepticism of what the Great Green Wall was to produce, today we have we have all seen that it is the only way to go for us to be able to make everlasting solutions. First of all, the Great Green Wall have shown us that one, nature-based solutions are the solutions that will provide the kind of change and the kind of uh, uh, so, uh, long-term solution that we really need uh, uh, when we are tackling uh, multi, uh, multi-faceted challenges like land degradation and desertification, especially in uh, uh, climate vulnerable areas like uh, the, the, the Sahel. The second uh, important lesson from the Good Green World is that all of us must come together. We uh, researchers, as we have seen, Susan and uh, Hoya, you guys cannot do it together. At the end of the day, you have to give us, give it to our policymakers, and our policymakers need to work with those who provide the funds, and those who provide the funds are going to work with those who will raise the funds for it to be able to work. And so that is what the Great Green Wall has shown us. Another third uh, lesson from the Great Green Wall is. The people on the ground, those who are the front line of these challenges or who are looking for solutions are those whom we should work with. Let's give them all the research, everything that we do, it should end up at the hands of the CBOs, the NGOs, and those in those communities to be able to implement. So for it to be able to, to work, uh, Susan, you must break it down and write it in such a way that it is not you to understand it, that the mother in the village can understand it, what you are trying to say. And another foot point that I would like to point out is that all these things that you are writing, go to those communities, I think who we are have said it, you will realize that these people know exactly what you have done. They know, these people know everything. We have seen that with, uh, with the stories of people like uh, Yakuba uh, Sawadego. Uh, with, with all uh, what has been doing in Burkina Faso. So what I'm trying to say is that, and it is true, it, it is bringing all these uh, people together that that has given the Great Green World the type of success and the type of, of visibility and the support that has been able uh, 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 to, to make the changes that we, that we want, mm -hmm. you know, and and the last part, uh, Peter, is the Great Green Wall now is now built into all the multilateral environmental and policy agreement that we have in our member states. Mm -hmm. we, we talk about the Africa Agenda 2063, you talk about the SDGs, you talk about um, uh, the Rio Conventions, you talk about every other thing. You see that the Great Green Wall is a melting pot of all of those things. So if we want our things to work. If we want the solutions that we want to work, we must mm -hmm. follow the pattern that was developed for the Great Green World. That is the real pattern to follow because it's a bit mm -hmm. of everything. We are not talking about only agroforestry or afforestation initiative. We are talking about everything. We're talking mm -hmm. about climate smart agriculture. We're talking about rangeland and pastoralists. We're talking about uh, today we are now talking about climate security because we realize that because of land degradation and desertification, there's a huge uh, issue of security. There's a lot of competition among our stakeholders. And so we are now, the way the, the program was created was open enough to be able to, to uh, take, uh, um, uh, um, uh, take uh, into consideration what we call emerging challenges, but also emerging opportunities mm -hmm. like um, mm -hmm. to do we are talking social media we are looking 
as, as drone technology we are looking at all presented and implemented of the Greek world. So uh, um, uh, thank you very much. Let me end here before I'm um, stopped and uh, hopefully we can have time where I can talk a bit more about our current results and, and uh, what our next plans. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Elvis. There are so many questions waiting for you. So just hold your breath. We'll get back to you very soon. So let's, let's hear now from George Wamukoya uh, on how all of this connects to the negotiations and, and, and Paris Agreement moving forward. George, over to you, please. Yeah, thanks, um, Peter. Very insightful presentations from colleagues. Um, uh, where I want to start is uh, where uh, Elvis has ended. <clears throat> One is that um, we need to make a difference. Africa is vulnerable to uh, the certification and um, and uh, land degradation, uh, which then means that uh, uh, for us to increase the uh, resilience of our communities and our economies, uh, we must address that. Now, from the climate perspective, I will give it from uh, around four or five areas. The first is uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, Paris Agreement uh, is one that uh, calls for global uh, response and uh, for all countries to play a role uh, in whichever small way. And, and this was, uh, it took a long time to negotiate it simply because uh, uh, the previous uh, instrument, particularly the Kyoto Protocol, the burden was on a few countries and now the the situation has changed, uh, even developing countries, uh, many of them have become the main source of uh, emissions. So with Paris Agreement, it, it calls for countries, each country, uh, to play a role. And it establishes, uh, let me use for purposes of discussion here, uh, two uh, uh, main goals. The uh, first goal is a uh, mitigation goal, which is temperature goal in at 2.1. Uh, and then, uh, and, 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 and uh, particularly A, which sets out that. Uh, and then in, in the paragraph, subparagraph B, it talks about increasing the ability to adapt to impacts of climate change, fostering uh, uh, climate resilient and uh, uh, transition into low uh, emissions. Now that already brings together adaptation, uh, resilience, and mitigation, and and, and and that was deliberate because I was uh, I was facilitating that that session uh, in the negotiations, uh, because uh, we have cases where, uh, and and I think uh, many colleagues have talked to this that. Uh, we are putting in place uh, firewalls uh, between adaptation and mitigation, when in reality, in the processes, natural processes, and uh, what uh, farmers or uh, communities do, uh, they actually deliver on both an adaptation and mitigation, and then we choose to report what we want. And yet we know, in reality, it, it, it delivers all those. It is, and then, and then uh, the, 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 the second goal is, the global goal on adaptation. This for the first time, uh, the, there is a deliberate effort to bring adaptation to be equal uh, or to be treated the same level as mitigation. Uh, and, and whereas in mitigation, we have the IPCC uh, guidelines uh, on, uh, on greenhouse uh, gas inventories, in adaptation for a long time, we have treated it as uh, uh, context specific or local, uh, we use very many terminologies. But in reality, now uh, there is evidence to show that uh, 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 adaptation is at different scales, including transboundary, uh, the cascading impacts, and the rest. So, uh, and that's why if you look at that, because 7 1 uh, as read with 2, it now looks at adaptation from local, uh, subnational, 
national, regional, and uh, global. And, and therefore, science must start looking at it from that perspective, which means it brings in the element of aggregation. Uh, we have, uh, because uh, the, the two degree, 1.5 degree, uh, uh, desires certain actions to be taken. Uh, and then the, the global goal on adaptation uh, requires uh, adequate adaptation response uh, linked to, uh, in, in line with the mitigation goal, if you look at ATCO 7.1. And, and, and that means that uh, uh, adaptation goal is linked to mitigation goal, uh, and, and therefore we must find uh, uh, aggregable indicators that deal with uh, redu re reducing vulnerability, which is uh, uh, an element under adaptation goal, uh, uh, resilience, uh, enhancing resilience, and number three is uh, uh, the, 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 the aspect of uh, adaptive capacity. And you can see that uh, they may be overlapping, but in terms of the Paris Agreement, those three elements uh, are the, uh, the, 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 the underpin the, the global goal on adaptation, which then raises the question, uh, as to uh, one, uh, uh, what uh, tools do we have to help us uh, to be able to uh, uh, assess and track uh, these goals? Uh, it may be clear in, uh, in uh, mitigation, but I think it's not very clear in, uh, in adaptation. And I know there are a lot of uh, efforts uh, trying to, to, to decipher that, and uh, Peter is one of those involved. So that's one. So, uh, we must change the way we do the research and the, sci and the science uh, because uh, policymakers are now required uh, to show the link between uh, the actions we are taking in mitigation and the corresponding actions in, in adaptation and the vice versa and how that is going to affect the two degree, 1.5 degree and, and, uh, and the elements of reducing vulnerability, resilience and, uh, and adapt increasing adaptive capacity. Then the second is how are countries uh, supposed to be uh, responding? All our countries are supposed to be communicating their NDC and, and the NDC is where countries identify uh, the actions, uh, which actions then become uh, uh, important, uh, both in terms of adaptation and mitigation. And, and this is where I, I think it's important because in, in most, uh, this, this NDC is based on the emission uh, uh, in what we call the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And, and if you look at the national communications of countries in Africa, uh, a large part of our emissions are from the land-based and more so AFOLU sector, agriculture, forestry, and other land use, which of which some of them are a result of land degradation and, and, and uh, the aspects of of the certification and uh, you know poor land use which result in all those so 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 the question then uh, uh, comes uh, since the countries have already given an indication uh, that uh, one we want uh, to uh, reduce emissions in a sector then uh, the, the presentation Susan made and uh, Huria and, uh, and, uh, and others, and, and of course uh, my brother Elvin, is important because then you have to look at what are the actionable uh, 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 areas that will be, if invested in, will result in reducing emissions, but also building resilience and, uh, and uh, uh, enhancing uh, uh, or reducing vulnerability. I think that uh, that is a critical area. And, and I know for a fact that uh, very many countries uh, in Africa, including Kenya, have uh, put nature-based solutions, for example, as, as one of the uh, areas uh, under adaptation, but also under mitigation. The question has been, what does that mean? Uh, in terms of uh, action on the ground uh, and in relation to restoration or uh, enhancement uh, programs. And then the, the other area which I think is important is uh, this, 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 I know IUCN and uh, others have defined what nature-based solutions are, but we have to look at it from the context in, in which we, we are looking at it, either from uh, Green, green Great Wall, 
or 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 in a, in a specific country interventions uh, because blanket uh, statements do not help and this is where i think we the, the scientists have an opportunity uh, because the under the standing committee of finance uh, under the unfcc it it's uh, in its work, pro, work work plan it is supposed to be defining uh, how nature based solutions would be funded and, and that means that uh, uh, agreeing on a, a, an understanding of what nature-based solutions and how it will look like is critical in order to ensure that uh, the, the, the nature-based solutions are uh, uh, appropriate in the context in which we, they are being used. And, and then, of course, finally, is uh, the question of uh, uh, synergy uh, between uh, synergies between the, the three Rio conventions. This has been a, a big talk uh, for a long time, but I think uh, the concept of nature-based solutions appears to be the one that uh, is likely to bring this uh, synergy uh, to manifest itself. Uh, one, because uh, nature-based solution has found its way in uh, into, the, into the climate change discourse, but also it is being discussed under the, the, the CBD and, uh, and CCD. And, 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 and I think with that convergence, then it means that uh, these tools uh, become important. So with all that, uh, performance management becomes important, Susan. Uh, we, we currently countries are struggling on uh, uh, what, what is the carbon accumulation rate in agroforestry systems. Uh, what uh, will be the uh, when they do restoration? Uh, what is the baseline, and then how do they build, and how do they monitor those? And I think those are things that uh, will be useful from the scientists uh, for purposes of community to to deliver on this. That's uh, I want to end there, Peter. Oh, thanks a lot, George. Thanks. That was a real to the force there from you. You know, uh, as always. Thanks a lot. Thanks. So we we'll, we've got quite a number of comments online. Um, I'll just you know, flag a few comments that have been raised by some people online and then uh, get back to some specific questions for all of the presenters to respond to. And then they'll have like a minute each or so to, to respond. Um, so I'll just ask the panelists to kindly have their pens ready because I'll go through their questions all in one go and then each of them will have uh, a minute or so to, to respond. But in terms of comments, I think there was an interesting comment from uh, Carol Saint Laurent uh, flagging and confirming that really uh, FLR is really beyond vegetation cover and that it could really help to have more of an, uh, an ecosystem uh, perspective. So we need, to, we need to keep that in mind. Um, and, and there was also uh, quite some questions about how uh, uh, forest landscape restoration relates to stopping deforestation and, and also stopping degradation. That uh, uh, someone from Uganda said that, you know, th these are, are highly connected because they feel that in Uganda, there's a lot of deforestation from logging and from charcoal uh, uh, and, and uh, can restoration sort of address those two at the same time, uh, 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 what, what is the, the connection? And there was a, there was a, 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 a big question from uh, Serena uh, uh, about asking about ecosystem, uh, ecosystem, is ecosystem restoration embedded in EC strategy? Um, um, there was some interest from South Africa and Indonesia about uh, a lot of local level uh, restoration that's happening and whether or not uh, how best to provide support for those those efforts so i think uh, those are really interesting uh, uh, points that we need to we need to to look at i i saw that um susan was already addressing quite a lot of interesting uh, questions online already uh, um, as we were going but there was one one thing stood out, you know, in 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 George's uh, quick quick reaction at the end about uh, uh, agroforestry carbon, and and also looking at performance measurements, how uh, and looking at that data that you are providing. So one of the questions for you would be, 
you know, how practical is it for people to access this kind of data and use them in their uh, reporting, you know, uh, 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 procedures? That would be one. I mean, there was a question for you about access to some of the other tools that TNC has uh, uh, that you can you can address. Um, uh, Huria, there was there was uh, there were some questions around. One question for you was specifically about whether there were any good practices uh, and, and, uh, and use of technologies that can facilitate restoration that is really culturally and social, that recognizes cultural and social diversity. Um, 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 uh, can you speak to that? But, but also, I think one of the comments and questions that have been coming also that you can try and speak to which I think George emphasized quite a bit also is the synergies between adaptation and, and, and mitigation. And, and uh, uh, a last set of things, I think addressing something around are the current adaptation approaches really responsive to the kinds of things that George was talking about in terms of, you know, looking at, you know, uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, indicators of, adaptive capacity, looking at all of the indicators of vulnerability, and how do you aggregate that? I think if you can try and address those in your short, quick response, that would be useful. Um, um, Tor, there was a, there were, a, you know, it's come up, you know, about aggregate, aggregation, you know, that uh, with NDCs, things are happening at the local level, and some people said they have a lot of activities at the local level. How, do you envisage the kinds of approaches that you're doing and the methods? One, can they allow them to participate and bring their data into those? And how are you preparing for the eventual aggregation of some of your parameters to, to be suitable at the global level? Because if, if the data is coming from landscapes and, and, and how do we aggregate those to national and then eventually to the global to see if we are meeting the global goal. I think if you can speak to those, that would be that would be helpful. Elvis, there were a number of questions for you. The first one is uh, from Achade uh, Nicola, who's asking whether there has been any evaluation of the Great Green Wall Initiative over, over the years and what is that, what is that showing? Um, the second thing that the question that was asked, I think Andrew Wardell uh, asked that uh, is um, a lot of the initiatives that are happening in Sahelian countries now are very minute compared to what has actually been pledged. So how do you see uh, meeting that gap in terms of the pledges versus what is actually happening? And the third question is, that uh, 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 you were referring to the importance of engaging policymakers. But in essence, some of the policymakers are actually benefiting from degradation. So how, how are you meeting that compromise and that conflict uh, 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 um, in, that, in that sense? I think those were some of the, the things. And then I think, George, there was a question that I thought you would really best fit to respond to is from someone, uh, it's from Kate Angus, who's talking about uh, how do we broker between science and knowledge and decision-making at different levels? How, how is that feeding into uh, the processes that you're dealing with maybe at international level, but more importantly for her, that that sort of science and knowledge process helps local communities. So we'll, we'll, we'll get the ball rolling maybe with uh, 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 Susan as the rest of you think about yours. Just one minute each, please. Sure, so Peter, you'd like me to talk about how good are carbon estimates for agroforestry and how can we access the data? Did I capture that correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes, please, yeah. Um, right, so this has been such a wonderful and informative session because it, uh, as everyone on the panel has emphasized there are so many different elements to consider when advancing forest landscape restoration. And I focus very narrowly on just getting good carbon estimates, which is just one piece of the puzzle, but it's an important one. Um, and 
you know, what we found is that there is an enormous amount of information out there. It's just distributed across papers, people, uh, the knowledge of people in the community. And so our goal is just to try to pull that together into an easily usable place. Um, and so we do make all of our data publicly available. The spatial layer I talked about is up on Global Forest Watch. Um, I put the link in the chat. Um, and we try to make our publications uh, publicly available as the journals allow. Um, and we're also building a platform where people can easily access all the raw data and the derived data as well. Agroforestry, we're in the middle of pulling all of that together. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm happy to share what I have compiled at this point, but there's no um, central repository for that yet. What I'll say is agroforestry is a giant um, umbrella of activities. You have things like civil pasture, you have shade grown cocoa, um, tree intercropping, um, these sort of multi-strata home gardens, fence roads, and all of that will impact the climate mitigation estimates. Um, so we're trying to pull that all together. And I'll just say that our numbers are best used for um, early on estimating what you might get, but for reporting purposes, you probably would need for like a carbon crediting project or to report up through the government, you would need uh, site specific measurements. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, thanks. Um, Huria? Can you hear me? Can yes, hear me? yes, please. Yeah, so th thank you for a really, really interesting discussion. Uh, so the first one was about the good practices and they are indeed a lot of good practices in, in the Sahel or other regions and I could give an example from the Sahel about uh, the Zai techniques where people who know who know the regreening uh, movement in the Sahel would know those are really farmer-led uh, strategies which actually indeed produced an interesting impact in terms of uh, bringing back the trees in, in the landscape. And those strategies need to be institutionalized and be a part of the solution. Yeah. Then uh, the next question was about the indicators and in terms of uh, looking at uh, adaptation and mitigation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, there is a lot of work uh, going on in many institutions about looking how to actually address this difference between adaptation and mitigation, because mitigation is a bit easier to, to kind of monitor, but adaptation is a bit complicated. So, but I see that in the last time, even in C4 and ECRAF, we are working on a tool actually called Gamma, where we are trying to bring all these complex issues which are related, for instance, to mm -hmm. the social aspect of adaptation, which are more difficult to put as, you know, as a variable or as, a, or as an indicator. And also to look at adaptation more as a transformational process rather just, you know, kind of fixing a little bit issues in the ecosystem and thinking with that we are going to adapt. Mm -hmm. Can you wrap uh, up I agree, seconds, please? Uh, Peter, yeah? Can you wrap Sorry? up in 30 seconds, please? Yes, yes, I think I think I, I am done. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Sorry for, for the pressure. Over to you, Tor. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Peter. Um, so on aggregation, I think um, one of the reasons, uh, one, sort of one of the things that motivated a lot of the work that we're doing is the fact that there wasn't really data available at accurate data at the local scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had a situation where you ended up disaggregating a lot of estimates at much coarser resolution, which is very challenging and often very inaccurate. So our approach is um, more around uh, making sure that we have accurate local estimates, uh, whether it's, for example, carbon sequestration potential. There's a lot of factors that determine what the potential is, if you're looking at soil carbon as an example, uh, what the potential is in a particular location. So we wanted to arrive at estimates that give us a high level of accuracy and also high spatial resolution around these types of estimates of, of what that potential is. And then the aggregation from there, if you want to go then to a sort of a national level, it was actually quite trivial. 
So, so the challenge is more around disaggregating things that are already aggregated rather than aggregating things that where you have good estimates locally. Hmm. Thanks. Okay. No, thanks. Really, really, really good. Really good. Elvis, over to you, please. Yes, uh, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, some interesting questions there. I think about evaluation, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we did an evaluation uh, in collaboration with UNCCD uh, a decade, a decade uh, uh, from um, implementation. Mm -hmm. And it showed that a lot has been done. Of course, uh, it showed about 15 to 18% of implementation of the initial plan. It showed a job in uh, in terms of job creation, in terms of work creation, uh, and uh, in terms of afforestation, agroforestry in this in this region. Yes, uh, and this uh, report is is very much online. And there was the issue of uh, this small and uh, fragmented projects. Yes, actually, that's why the Great Green Wall was created. The Great Wall was created uh, to to bring together all the initiatives in a pan African approach so that countries can have uh, um, uh, can work together both internally and uh, through transboundary programs and so uh, the good goal was created to bring all of these programs together if you look at the preamble it says you have to bring together implementation of the three real conventions and all what I've been doing under a big umbrella program called the good green world so mm -hmm. uh, we we're very positive that and we are already seeing that uh, going on. We have various transboundary programs. We have uh, programs that are being implemented by our partners and they are working together. As far as policies are concerned, yeah, he talked about uh, a degradation uh, favoring some po policymakers. Of course, uh, it's very clear that uh, those who want to undertake extensive agriculture or even and the plantation, uh, uh, plantation forestry will certainly undertake some level of degradation. But that's why uh, there is a serious need for this uh, um, uh, interface between science policy research and, and, and our policymakers. That's why it is very important that the policymakers understand clearly what is going on, understand the science of it, as, uh, as uh, uh, Brother George was saying. We must make sure that you don't just invite policymakers to come and open and close meetings. Ensure that they are inside and they understand what is going on because everything should be evidence based. If not, these wrong, wrong, wrong approaches uh, will keep on going and will keep on uh, uh, blaming the politicians. But let's engage them at our own level. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Just uh, over to you, George. Just before we yeah up. yeah I think very briefly uh, to, to answer your question Peter I think I think the uh, uh, climate change uh, in Africa has uh, precipitated uh, a close uh, working relationship between uh, the scientists and and the policymakers and and uh, Peter you may recall that uh, when for the first time agriculture was uh, introduced into the into the UNFCC negotiations. Uh, um, then I was with the Comesa, which is a regional economic community, working with the, with ECRAF. We convened a meeting between uh, scientists and and policymakers, and out of that, uh, we 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 actually present, made a presentation on on what we thought was important to the ministers of environment a meeting, which was back to back. And as a consequence, since then, uh, that's how Agnes was formed, and, uh, and that's how influential it, it has uh, remained. And, and I think that's a very important. But just to give you an example, a practical example, based on what Elvis has just indicated, is that uh, countries have uh, Af in Africa have submitted the NDCs. What we've done is uh, assessed the, the, the looked at the indicators they have, uh, uh, the actions and the indicators that uh, they have indicated. Uh, to to track uh, those uh, those actions, and uh, out of the fifty countries that we have looked, we we have uh, managed to access uh, their NDCs and assess. Uh, there's a disconnect. One of the uh, outcome there's a disconnect between the actions and the indicators, such that even if all those indicators were to be assessed it will not give a true picture of whether they have adapted or not. So that becomes, a, and, and we, we, we're just finishing that uh, report and we're going to engage with the policymakers from all the five sub-regions of Africa so that uh, we, 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 they need to relook at 
uh, the indices and make them uh, uh, appropriate. And, and uh, finally, uh, and that's to Tor and uh, Susan and everyone else, uh, the Africa right now has a challenge in the sense that, uh, like the good work that Television is doing, it's amenable to Article 6 uh, market uh, mechanism, particularly private sector and the rest. The question that, has, uh, ha that we are struggling with is, do we have a metrics to help us uh, assess the soil carbon, for example, in, in all these uh, uh, various uh, approaches that we're using uh, that will be amenable to uh, meet the voluntary or the, or, or the regulated uh, carbon market. And, and that's an area that probably we will be very happy to work with you guys uh, so that uh, uh, we make a submission uh, uh, as the immediately the, the rule book of the Article 6 is constructed. It's an area it is important for Africa because uh, Africa, its comparative advantage is in land base. And, 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 and therefore using, for example, the work Elvis is doing, it should be one of the first to benefit because besides the uh, local and national uh, benefits, it is also contributed to the public good. And, and, and uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, I was invited to talk to this. Thanks. Okay. No, Sorry, good, good. good. No, George, I think, I think you, you, you wrapped it up really well. I, I, I'm really grateful. I think uh, we've had fantastic speakers. We've gone through a series of things, really talking about the importance of uh, linking adaptation and mitigation as we think about forest landscape restoration, the real importance of looking at indicators, looking at aggregation, and also making sure that we are talking about the broader ecosystem, you know, uh, uh, as, as we restore and looking at performance uh, across a number of issues. And, 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 and with that, we need to link up with policymakers, we need to link up with communities, the science and the data need to speak to one another. So uh, I'm really grateful. Can we, a big hand to our, uh, speakers, please, for the good job they've done. Uh, um, really, really good job. Uh, and, and we hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you very much to the 150, 60 people that have been following online as well. Thanks a lot to the backup team, uh, Amy, uh, Adinda, uh, Wigit, Stephanie. Uh, really, really good job. Thanks, thanks everyone, and, and goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks once again. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thanks, thanks. Uh, was our your parents? Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Great. What a fantastic session with great dialogue and great insight. Uh, for more on these topics, check out the resources found on the session agenda. There are also being posted in the chat, so keep an eye out for those. A reminder that the hashtag for today is hashtag Restore Together. Let's have a look at some of the comments that we see on social today. So one here, it says, I like the part when one of the panelists said that this is not a decade of tree planting, but a decade of ecosystem restoration. Thank you. Yes, it definitely resonated with that. Another, learning from today, restoration can start with people not planting trees. Restoration should not only focus on forests, but also grasslands, wetlands, and so on. And our last comment that we're gonna spotlight we should plant trees that will be adapted to the future climate of the land use. Thank you everyone for your engagement on social media. We want to keep hearing them, keep them coming. We appreciate them and we love them. Now we will look, we will now have a break, but first we will have a short inspirational talk by Steve Mukungwa, Senior Lecturer of Lalongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources and GLFX Lalongwe Chapter Lead. Malawi's landscapes are heavily degraded. We are experiencing many challenges in terms of food security, shortages of water, and also increased vulnerability to climate change impacts. The government of Malawi took an initiative to commit itself to restore 4.5 million hectares of land by 2030. Now for the country to get to that, it faces a lot of barriers. One of the major barriers that we have in the country is the inadequate capacity of the personnel who are pushing for this uh, landscape installation in the country. 
the Center for Applied System Analysis, in collaboration with the International Union of Forest Research Organization, UFRO, developed a proposal to work and again uh, build the capacity of uh, FRR facilitators and practitioners in the country. One, realizing that uh, forest landscape installation is a, a social process that engaged or that involves so many stakeholders. The second aspect we considered was that um, uh, making a distinct separation or realization that there are so many players within forest landscape restoration, uh, ranging from the policy makers, the practitioners themselves, and also the people at the ground itself. Because of these three categories, our approach was that uh, each category should be managed different from the other depending upon the needs of that particular category. For example, the first category that we focus on is uh, for the policy makers, especially the three arms of government, the executive, the judiciary, and also the registrator. They needed to have knowledge about forest landscape restoration, more especially the right mix of regulations and policies that can enable uh, the local actors to accelerate forest landscape restoration on the ground. This little approach requires awareness raising to understand about all these issues, uh, which can be implemented through either panel discussion or different forms that can suit that particular category. The second level of capacity building are the, the frontline staff who needs to have knowledge of planning, uh, monitoring, and also communicating this forest landscape installation to enable the farmers be able to interact and resolve challenges that they're able to face as they're implementing forest landscape installation at the ground. Then the third category are the farmers themselves. They really require to work together with those people that are facilitators so that they can design and also co-develop forest landscape installation and improvement on the ground where the uh, frontline staff they are with the farmers throughout the entire process and at the end of the day the farmers are able to do all these aspects on their own. Looking at these three aspects, that is the design which we are there based on the wide experience of UFRO, we found that this is an approach that can actually enhance capacity building on the ground and be able to accelerate forest landscape restoration as we are all on this journey of restoring our degraded landscapes. Thank you, Dr. Mokungwa, for that inspiring talk and insight into forest and landscape restoration efforts on the ground in Malawi. We'll take a short break now, and we'll see you at the top of the hour for the next session.
Welcome back, everybody. Glad everybody is here again. So now we are ready to start the second half of our program. It is my pleasure to introduce Thais Linares Juvenal, team leader of forest governance and economics of the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, to set the scene for the next session, restoration as economic enterprise and driver of job creation. Thank you, Rosario. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. More than 300 billion US dollars are needed to meet the land restoration needs. OECD data on Q2 2018 shows that in the last decade, ODA commitments to the forest sector have been within the range from 1 to 1.2 billion US, US dollars per year. Even if more public commitments are made, including through domestic budgets, it is clear that private finance has an important role to play. The meaningful contribution from the private sector will be achieved through the understanding of restoration, not only as a means to generate ecosystem services, but also as an activity connected to the productive sectors. Restoration is not only corporate responsibility or the need to meet regulations, it's also a business. Forest restoration as an economic enterprise involves assessing the different businesses and stakeholders along the restoration value chain. There are plenty of opportunities if activities are planned to reconcile the environmental requirements with attractive returns to the private sector. And those opportunities translate into generation of income and employment where it is most needed, smallholders and small and medium enterprises in the rural areas. The Forest Resource Assessment 2020 shows that the increase in the area of planted forests has slowed down in the last 10 years, suggesting that the growth of sustainable wood value chains will be limited by the resource base very soon. The potential for growth is clear. FAO estimations show that the forest sector directly contributes contributes to around 1.1% of the global GDP. The total contribution through leakage to other economic sectors more than double this amount. The impact of the forest sector activities are particularly high on generation of employment. Restoration can be a cornerstone of the bioeconomy, delivering climate, biodiversity, low carbon products, income, and employment. Markets are demonstrating high interest in business delivering environmental, social, and governance results, the ESGs. Sustainable investment funds reached more than 1 trillion US dollars in 2020. The need and the opportunity request immediate action. I am very glad to be part of this panel and to introduce the, uh, uh, the, our next discussions, which is bridging the capacity gap to reach the scale needed. This panel will present several ongoing initiatives, existing tools to provide support to entrepreneurs to develop their sustainable restoration business case. The speakers of this first panel are Marco Boscolo from FAO. Marco Boscolo is a forestry officer in the Forest Governance and Economics team at FAO. His work focuses on inclusive and sustainable forest value chains, access to finance, the economics of ecosystem restoration, and community concessions as conservation and development instruments. Mr. Boscolo is going to be accompanied by Mr. Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Gessens. Uh, Jonathan is a UNEP program officer at the Climate Finance Unit. His role involves coordinating and technically supporting sustainable land use finance plans, uh, finance programs. Prior to joining UNEP, Jonathan worked in the banking sector as a risk manager and as a strategy consultant. Jonathan holds a PhD in economics and finance from the ETH Zurich. Amanda Gant is also a panel member today. 
She is an accelerator manager for the Global Restoration Initiative, where she works to improve and expand the program's growing land accelerator program. Since 12, 2012, she has organized startup boot, plan, boot camps and virtual mentorship programs to support entrepreneurs in Africa, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and Asia on behalf of the US Department of State and the World Bank. Amanda holds a master's degree in international public policy and a bachelor's degree in a foreign service, both from in foreign service, sorry, both from Georgetown University. It's my pleasure to welcome the speakers, and I hope we have great discussions today. Thank you very much. Marco, I think you are the first one, please. Okay, thank you. If I can ask uh, to put the presentation. Thank you, Thais, very much for this introduction. And um, thank you also to all the participants who are joining us online. Uh, it is good to, to see you here. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is to launch the publication Developing Bankable Business Plans, a learning guide for forest producers and their organizations. Uh, this guide was developed to improve the capacity, as the title says, of small producers, their organization, and small and medium enterprises to access private finance for sustainable forest-based businesses. Basically, for those local champions that were mentioned earlier in the sessions. The premise behind the development of this guide is that some restoration activities, whether they be tree planting, agroforestry systems, using residues uh, as a resource can be turned into a commercially viable business. And it is helpful to look at restoration through a business lens, at least for three main reasons. So if we can go to the next slide. The first reason is that when we link restoration to the development of businesses and value chains, we make restoration attractive to private finance. Studies have estimated in the hundreds of billions the funds that are needed, for example, to reach land degradation neutrality. And this level of funding cannot be met through public finance alone. It is important to mobilize private finance as well as a complement to public investment. The second reason is that when we link restoration to the development of businesses, we link it to the generation of incomes, to employments, improve livelihoods, like Thais was saying just a moment ago. And they will have an additional stake in the success of these efforts. In other words, commercially viable forest-based business are a key component of inclusive, resilient, and sustainable landscapes. And third, there are many producers who can increase the benefits they can derive from their activities by understanding better how to participate in forest value chains, how to professionalize their work, how to transition from subsistence to business practices. Next slide. So in many ways, restoration is a great opportunity, can provide a number of benefits. And at the same time, smallholders and their organizations and communities, especially in low-income countries, typically struggle to access finance due to a number of obstacles, including limited knowledge, of the business planning process, an unclear learn, earning logic for the business and the potential to scale it up, and a weak understanding of investors' criteria. Next slide. And over the last two years, we also spoke to many potential investors who identify in a limited pipeline of bankable projects a constraint to investments, even if their interest is high as we can tell from the press releases we have received in recent weeks and shown here. So next slide. And it is in this context that FAO has developed, and it is my pleasure to launch today this publication, Developing Bankable Business Plans. It is a guide that aims to be accessible, aims to be practical, and to promote businesses that are good 
for people and the planet. Next slide. So this publication covers what it takes and what are the key elements to make your business idea attractive to a bank, to a private investor, to a private company, or someone who can either loan you or invest with you to implement or scale up your business. The guide is organized in 10 modules, which together provide a roadmap in the preparation of a business plan. The modules cover how to organize evidence for your business idea, how to communicate that your organization has the skills and competence to implement the business, how to assess the market for your product or service, how to also assess your nature-based assets, how to assess your competition, which technology will you use to implement the business and also your business environment and legal issues. One module is dedicated on how to carry out a financial analysis, one on how to consider environmental, social, and governance criteria and indicators, and one on risk assessment and mitigation. Next slide, please. So each module includes a description with the main ideas, some examples from real world business cases, web-based tools that are available and ready to use to address specific aspects of developing a business plan, references and checklists to help you keep track with compliance requirements. Next slide. So let me close uh, by mentioning some next steps that uh, we're taking. We are developing an e-learning course through FAO e-learning Academy that will be available late in 2021. We also continue to promote the dissemination of these materials through our programs like the Restoration Initiative, the Forest and Farm Facility, our partners and projects, and also working in partnership with incubator and mentorship platforms. And I am very happy to be following this session by two examples of these partnerships. So let me conclude by saying that if you lead or coordinate projects, manage an incubator or accelerator, we hope you will find this guide useful and we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Marco. So I would like to invite Jonathan as for the next presentation. Thank you very much, Thais, for this opportunity to talk about some of the work of UNEP in the restoration finance space. As many of you certainly know, UNEP is committed to accelerating the number of restoration initiatives around the world, um, primarily to achieve the objective of the UN decade on restoration in the Bowen Challenge. But that requires that we exponentially increase the number of restoration projects getting off the ground and give them the opportunity to scale. This demands to urgently address the finance gap that has been mentioned um, many times previously, as too little finance, and especially private finance, is presently directed at restoration business IDs. Next slide, please. One of the main barriers is the lack of a well-functioning restoration finance pipeline um, capable of producing economically viable IDs that can be connected to the right financing players and mechanisms. To address this challenge, UNEP is promoting a system approach that supports both the finance side and the project side of the pipeline simultaneously, because only by increasing supply and demand, you can achieve true scale. Next slide, please. Can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. On the finance side, UNEP has recently launched, with funding from the German and Luxembourg governments, the Restoration Sea Textile Facility, or RSCF. It provides co finance in support of funds and pipeline development, recognizing that one of the main challenges for restoration investors is the pre investment stage, which is both resource intensive and risky. Fund managers have often limited funding available, and as a result, they need to limit the size of the development pipeline, and in turn, that leads to reduced levels of investment in HLR. Next slide, please. 
So RSES has three support lines. The first one is dedicated to fund development. The facility can provide co-funding up to 750,000 US dollars for a period of 18 to 24 months to help funds reach closing. A second support line can help cover up up to 50% of pipeline development eligible costs, including feasibility studies, business case development, and the establishment of the geographical presence. And the third support line is further down the line and targets projects who are already established, but might still struggle with specific project development issues. The fund also co-funds up to 50% of the project development costs, including legal and fiscal studies, due diligence, and ENS impact monitoring. Next slide, please. The goal of RSCS is to have at least six new funds created and 20 projects invested. The facility is actively looking for eligible candidates. So I'll share the contact details at the end of the presentation for anyone interested. Next slide, please. On the project development side, UNEP has just kicked off a new capacity building initiative called the Restoration Factory that Marco mentioned. The Restoration Factory is one of the finest focused outputs of the Restoration Initiative, a just funded collaboration between IUCN, FAO, and UNEP, which aims to develop and promote landscape restoration blueprint in 10 Asian and African countries. The factory itself is an e-learning incubation program that helps restoration entrepreneurs develop attractive and tested business models of restoration. It harnesses the expertise of a community of private sector mentors who provide regular advice and challenge the assumptions of the entrepreneur. It promotes a method of empirical validation, encouraging developers to go out and experiment their ideas, like reaching out to potential clients and customers to validate the value proposition, or studying the competition to, un to understand the comparative advantage or the potential weaknesses of the project. Next slide, please. The rigorous six-month training prog program is built around the MIT's Discipline Entrepreneur Matrix. It's powered by the Bridge for Billion platform, the leading social enterprise that has already helped more than 1,500 entrepreneurs. For the purpose of the program, it is complemented with specific training materials developed by FAO, like the guide that Marco has been working on, IUCN, UNEP, WWF Landscape Finance Lab, and Partnership for Forest. The factory has links already established with incubators and impact investors to provide funding opportunity to its participants. Next slide, please. So the program has been designed to encourage eco-entrepreneurs to develop an habit of testing, grant truthing, and validating the domain areas of their business ID, from value proposition to competition and shareholder mapping, marketing and financial plans, impact strategy, growth plans, all articulated around eight learning tools. Its main output is the preparation of a substantiated business plan, rich with market data, which can pave the way for the deployment of a minimum viable intervention supported by accelerators, impact investors, and donors. Next slide, please. Our first cohort is currently undertaking the program. We have 13 enterprises and 26 mentors from the private sector to support them. The long-term goal is to use the factory as a low-cost, white-label white, lab, white label delivery model that any restoration developer or investor can use to provide some cool business capacity building to their pipeline of projects. It aims to accelerate the investment origination process by encouraging business plan consistency and quality. Next slide, please. So I encourage anyone who wants to know more about these two projects to contact us using the two email addresses shown on the slide, one for the facility, the other one for the factory. And I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Thanks, Ike. You see, you're muted. Is it unmuted now? Yes. Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. It was a very interesting presentation. 
Um, I would like to invite Amanda Gant now for the next presentation. Thank you so much. Um, go ahead and uh, share my PowerPoint screen. Thank you guys so much for having this for us. And I just wanted to um, share a little bit about the Land Accelerator again. Um, I have been asked to share my remarks in about two minutes, so we'll do so. Wanted to particularly share a little bit that we have been working uh, with entrepreneurs in the land restoration landscape since 2018. Uh, and let me see, uh, our first year we worked with 12 companies in 2019 and for with 14 companies in Africa. Uh, this year we've done 15 each in South Asia and Latin America. Uh, but this year we've really come under our stride and we're going to be, uh, we're going to be working with, let's see, almost uh, 300, no, it's almost 250 this year. Uh, we're going to be outreaching to 100 entrepreneurs in Africa, 20 in Malawi, about 30 each in Peru and Ecuador, uh, in addition to 60 in South Asia. And we've got this pipeline that's already underway. Uh, we had over 1,350 entrepreneurs from Africa alone apply for a cohort of 100 this year. So we're very excited to serve the market. And I wanted to just focus on a little bit um, of what we've learned along the way uh, from working with these uh, 56 country, uh, companies. Something that we've definitely learned is obviously what can they get from an accelerator program? And I think you'll be hearing from a couple of our graduates later in the session today. Uh, but what be, might be interesting for some of the people on this call is what could an accelerator uh, mean for you? And obviously it's a lot of exposure to new ideas, uh, people to handhold you along the way as you think about how to implement new ideas, how to uh, brand yourself, market yourself, and share who you are with external, hand, with external partners, with new employees, with the community who's going to buy from you, and with the investment community who's going to invest in you. So we work on all of that at the Land Accelerator. And even, even after doing that um, successfully, uh, we see sometimes that entrepreneurs are still not um, accessing some of that financing. And I'd want to share a little bit about what we've experienced uh, are some of those barriers uh, to the financing. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, we're, we're probably all familiar here that there is a shortfall of financing for restoration overall. Uh, whether that's coming from private sector or public sector funding, the need is greater than the supply of funding. So that's just a, a major, pro, a major pro problem for the sector. Um, but I guess that in addition, we're seeing that many of the investors are looking for big projects. They're having a tough time finding it. And many of the other kinds of lenders out there are looking for either established value chains, which are often not in the restoration sector. You know, the restoration sector might be looking at doing innovative crops, uh, intercropping, new techniques, uh, bamboo, non-timber forest products, things that lenders don't traditionally understand. But they also, um, other lenders are, you know, they're micro lenders, so they're not used to helping companies scale up. So we're seeing a missing middle. And I just wanted to make that clear as we go forward with the rest of the projects here, because you can see how some of them have managed to bridge that gap. And that could be a lesson for people on the call, uh, whether you're an entrepreneur or a community member. Uh, so I wanted to probably just stop sharing because I uh, wanted to give more space to some of our entrepreneurs to, to reach, but I am gonna put in the chat box my contact information and a call to action for anyone who'd like to find out about additional sessions that we have coming up, as well as opportunities to mentor. Um, this is available and I've put that in the chat box and want to thank everybody for your time. Sorry, for some reason, the automatic mute is not uh, working, so I'm sorry. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, do we have questions for this panel?
Okay, I have here one question. What is your what is the greatest challenge in access? The lands are being contested, boundaries are overlapping, projects are not large, are not in, in large scale. Okay, so um, the biggest barrier that companies, I would say, are facing, even when they're very prepared for it, is that the investor landscape, I would say, is very fragmented. And so you'll go to so many different investors and they'll say, that's really nice, but we do this small thing or we do that small thing. So I would say that that's a big barrier, actually, is uh, the transparency um, of identifying who the right investors are for you. That could be something. Uh, that we've noticed because when you find the right investor uh, you can still get financing but it can it can be a long journey uh, they're very focused on specific regions or specific um, sustainable development goals so they can they can take a while to navigate and now uh, we're working to kind of build that network and and keep track of that uh, but it's easier to find some sorts of in investors than it is to other sorts of investors Thank you, Amanda. I have a question also to Marco. Marco, uh, you presented these uh, learning guides. Um, what restoration activities you think can attract private finance? Could you be a bit more specific on what are the opportunities along the value chain? Yes, thank you, Thais, for this question. Well, I um, Access to finance, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, make uh, investors uh, a little bit cautious is, is the issue, for example, of the long gestation of some of these projects. But uh, in the work we've been doing in piloting this guide, uh, we identify, for example, um, opportunities in the organization of farmers. So uh, tree growers, uh, when they organize together, they can actually... Uh, provide a, a more reliable, uh, better quality graded uh, wood and non-wood products. They can purchase some equipment. Uh, these are all things that can help uh, with the restoration of their lands and also release uh, pressure in, in natural areas. Um, another, uh, several interesting applications have been in the use of uh, agriculture and, uh, wood and forest residues to make uh, energy, for example, in making green charcoal. These are some of the examples that are included in the, in the, uh, in the guide and I think uh, make for good example of restoration too. Thank you very much, Marco. And uh, Jonathan, um, do you have uh, uh, already um, a, a picture of what will be the main clients of these two uh, tools, these two facilities that you, you presented today? Yeah, so our ambition is really to engage the community of impact investors, especially those who are focusing or you know, have the, the majority of their activities and investments in the restoration space. So we have, we, as I said in my presentation, we are already in touch with a few of them. And the purpose here is really to help accelerate the speed at which they develop their own pipeline. Because um, for some of them, if they've been doing it for years and they have the experience and the expertise, but they still struggle because they have to do pretty much everything from scratch. And the early stage development is something that is really costly, really time consuming, and something that we hope that we will be able to accelerate. So impact investors first, and then there will be also opportunities for secondary capital markets to, to open up to other uh, financiers and, and you know, investment players. Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to uh, thank all the presenters for this very insightful uh, presentations. Um, I think the presentations were very clear on the need to build capacity to access finance. So leveraging finance is not only a matter of availability of finance, but it's also a matter of being able to access it. And some exercise also regarding you know, the matchmaking, making investors and uh, the opportunities uh, um, connect uh, to each other. 
Um, I would like to thank again all the presenters and all those that are uh, watching this uh, webinar. And I would like to hand the floor to the next panel, which will also be uh, a very interesting uh, discussion. So I would like to pass the floor to Ulrich Appel for the next uh, for the next panel on concrete actions to support the forest land restoration. Thank you very much. Thank you and uh, hello everyone online. So I have the pleasure to moderate the second panel in this in this session. My name is Ulrich Appel. I coordinate the land restoration efforts at the Global Environment Facility and it's really a pleasure to be here today with you because restoration is a very important topic for the Jeff as one of the biggest uh, grant makers for restoration projects worldwide. Now, in, in this uh, second panel, we want to delve deeper into the concrete actions on how to support restoration and sustainable value chain development and uh, job creation, and uh, especially on how um, the uh, tools that have just been introduced, the restoration factory, the learning guide, the land accelerator, how they have been applied. And um, the time for restoration is really now. So every initiative counts. And I have uh, five uh, exciting panelists with me who have a lot of experience with innovative initiatives and uh, they are going to share with you. So let me quickly uh, introduce the, the panel members. In no particular order, we have uh, Blaise Baudin. Uh, Blaise works on the economics of ecosystem restoration, also called the TEER initiative. And he's a consultant for the Secretariat of the Convention of uh, Bio Biodiversity and um, works also for the forest landscape restoration mechanism of the, of the FAO. Uh, then I have with me, um, Kathomi Nyeru, or Kuki, as her friends call her. And she heads the outreach department of Greenpot Enterprises. And together with her team, she works in Kenya to empower communities through bamboo marketing. And then we have um, Major Sharma on our panel today. Major Sharma uh, has retired uh, from the army, but he had then the splendid idea to found uh, Gratitude Farms, which is an architect startup and all about organic farming and the social enterprise. I have also Tommaso Menini with us today, the CEO of Agar. Agar is the African Agency for Arid Resources, an award-winning company with well-known brands. And uh, uh, Tommaso is uh, really a favored, fervent conservationist and a dryland expert. And we, we look forward to hear his uh, perspective on, on drylands. And finally, last but not least, we have Luis Mabulo with us, who is a chef and a young entrepreneur and the founder of the Cacao Project in the Philippines. And uh, Luis, you have so many awards, so let me mention only one. Uh, you have been on the Forbes Asia list for 30 under 30 young entrepreneurs. We, we, we are glad to have you and we will later hear your perspective on, on this panel. So I will now uh, ask a question to uh, each uh, panelist to get us started. And for the audience, please put your questions, your comments, your suggestions in, in the chat box. And we hope to get back to them uh, after our first round of, of questions. So let me uh, start with, uh, with Blaze. Um, and le let's really start with a fundamental question here. Uh, Blaze, what, what data and information is needed to support the transformation to, to a restoration economy? Yes, uh, thank you, Ulrich. Uh, and uh, I'm a little bit the odd one out in this panel of entrepreneurs. Uh, but I came here to talk about the, the, an initiative called uh, the, the TIER for the Economics of Ecosystem Restoration, which is uh, about collecting data on the costs and benefits of restoration. And I think we've heard since the, the beginning of, of this event uh, how it's, it's difficult to, making, uh, to make offer and demand meet uh, when it comes to restoration finance. And uh, the way that the TIER is aiming to contribute uh, is by uh, offering some answers 
that uh, to some of the questions that we think are lingering on both sides of these issues. And these are basic questions like how much does ecosystem restoration actually cost? How does this cost vary across countries, type of ecosystem, uh, objectives or level of degradation? And finally, like how uh, will these costs be offset eventually by the expected benefits that restoration uh, provides and if then after how long? And so uh, the TIER initiative was started by a coalition of partners, uh, including FAO, the CBD, C4, WRI, uh, with the view to set up this uh, standard framework to collect data and, uh, on restoration projects and build this global database uh, on the costs and benefits of restoration. And we think that this is going to be helpful. Um, and so to answer your question, uh, you know, this is a long-term multi-partner collaborative effort that is just starting, but I think it's going to, uh, to provide answers to these questions and that this could be helpful in two main ways. The first one is that once we will have better data uh, on costs and benefits of restoration, uh, I, we think it will facilitate the work of restoration practitioners to properly budget their restoration interventions and uh, also will make them more aware of the potential benefits of restoration without overpromising. And on the other side, uh, you know, for investors looking at a financing plan, uh, it will give them a, a benchmark of how much restoration costs in a given context and the type of investment of, uh, of return on their investment that they could expect. And so we think uh, we want to highlight the importance of collecting such data and this long-term effort. And so we're inviting um, uh, all projects, uh, you know, even in this panel and uh, that are listening to to contribute and to participate to this data collection process. And uh, you can access the, the form uh, on our webpage uh, that my colleague will, will, will share in the chat. And um, yeah, we hope that, that with uh, eventually collecting such data will, will help uh, bridge that gap. Thank you, Blaise. Yeah, that's really, that's really an important foundation for, for all of our work with data and information. Let me turn to uh, Cookie now. Uh, Cookie Greenpot Enterprises, that is really um, uh, a nice name. Can you tell us more a little bit about your business model and then, of course, on, on how your business idea was uh, influenced by the Accelerator program? Cookie, please. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, first I'll start by saying that I'm from Greenpot Enterprises. We pride ourselves in the name, the Bamboo People. We are Kenya's first fully integrated bamboo company, whereby we start with nurseries, plantations, and also restoration efforts, and also are moving to the factory side, where we're going to now make money off the restoration efforts that we've made. Because as you've had everybody talking about, uh, financing restoration is expensive. So unless you turn it into an enterprise, it becomes a bit difficult. Um, in 2018, I had the opportunity of being uh, in the first cohort of the landscape restoration program. <clears throat> and I remember when we went to this uh, landscape restoration, one of the biggest issues we had is we have great restoration efforts. How come we cannot be able to get financing? So I remember that um, we went through a series of trainings for about four days, four intense days, which ended up uh, having a pitch day at the end so that you have a demo pitch day where you actually pitch to investors. But the most interesting thing was that the efforts that we have and the financiers are not being able to be merged together. So you have to find out who is the right person to work with, who, who is the person interested in your business, or better still, who is the person that you can work with so that you can create a better product that they can then push forward instead of being too rigid. So um, my most exciting time that time was uh, the pitch day because we find that we, are, we get excited about what we do. So we want to say everything at the same time and sometimes people don't have time for that. Just realizing that you can narrow down your pitch, make it exciting, make people interested in what you're doing and then get people to work with later on was very, very exciting for us. And I can say that after that, we have done dozens of pitches, but finally we, we ended up getting a partner uh, the Nature Conservancy that we're working with on a number of projects. And we, it was really, really exciting. It's, it's something I would 
I would ask everybody who is in restoration to do. Use the tools that we saw before and get in there, get information so that you can be able to align with the investors. The way they think and the way a business person thinks sometimes isn't the same. So it will be interesting to just get in there and get that education. Thank you, Koki. That, that's, uh, that's interesting and, and inspiring. I think we can all learn from, from your experience. And uh, I, I see on the next uh, screen here in the panel is Tommaso. So let me turn to uh, uh, Tommaso. And uh, we wanted to talk a little bit uh, also about the dryland context and uh, how restoration and business can be, can be merged successfully, uh, especially in this context. Uh, Tommaso, please. Yes, good, uh, good afternoon from the uh, south of Kenya. We, we have started working in dry lands from uh, 2018, uh, sorry, 2017 as a private sector, but before I was coordinating um, uh, development projects and that's how I really learned the territory. Now, we, um, we have this idea of dry lands being these uh, uh, rocky, uh, desolated uh, territories um, and hey, sometimes they are, uh, but uh, there is a lot of potential that we can uh, we can look at, and um, these communities as well. Nearly, um, nearly everywhere, these communities are also pastoralist. So, um, uh, overdependency to livestock has created quite a number of problems. Uh, the drought is cyclic, so we know that um, these these few resources need to be properly uh, utilized. And, and done so sustainably, which is how we started. We started by wild harvest and wild harvest only of uh, certain commercial uh, uh, trees, uh, commercial resources from trees of interest, uh, which uh, grow in arid and semi-arid lands. We deal in gum arabic, frankincense, myrrh, these are gum and raisins, uh, also known as NTFP. And uh, recently, in the last two years, we started they're also looking at aloe, uh, not aloe vera, which is what everyone knows, aloe secundiflora. Now, this aloe is indigenous to Kenya and is a very uh, sturdy um, plant. Now, we have, uh, we have won a grant from the British government. This grant is allowing us to, to set nurseries, and these nurseries will, will in turn go and create um, farms, aloe farms. The, the good things about aloes, this one in specific, is that it can grow literally on rocks and on sandy uh, soils and territory. This means that lands that is completely unused or uh, considered degraded can be now restored. Farms can in turn um, give an income to the community. So that's how we create income. That's how we create um, employment in, uh, in in arid lands. We uh, we believe that this is a restoration um, initiative that can even improve through the usage of intercropping, and that. Yeah, Tommaso, I, I think we we have we have lost you, but th these were very um, uh, encouraging remarks. It is really encouraging to hear that. Uh, drylands have uh, such a sorry. I potential. don't know <laughs> what happened. Yeah, we, we, lo <laughs> we lost you in between. Um, Here I am. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, but sorry, I, sorry I was. So don't, don't worry. I think you, we 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 really got your your points and messages. It's very encouraging to hear that drylands have such a huge potential for uh, restoration, and yep. uh, that we maybe we can come back later to to this topic. Um, let me turn now to next on our uh, panel screen is Luis uh, Mabulo. And um, uh, Luis, we, we really wanted to get your advice, especially for young entrepreneurs um, uh, trying to get into restoration initiatives. And also, we would love to hear more about your cacao project. Please, floor is yours. Definitely. Thank you so much, Ulrich, for that question. It's a really lovely question, I think. And I think it requires a little bit of background. Now, to give you some background, my country, the Philippines, is the most vulnerable country to hazards brought about by climate change and is a country prone to severe environmental degradation, with much of the country facing deforestation and environmental harms on top of the risk of droughts and cyclones each year. Not only that, but we are also facing food insecurity because of an aging population of farmers and a landscape where youth aren't empowered to take on 
change in this industry. Now, I founded my social venture called the Cacao Project to cultivate sustainable and resilient economic forests for our farmers using nature-based solutions to increase their resiliency, improve their livelihoods, and better support their families for sustainable success. After seeing how farmers have suffered year after year in the yearly struggle of intensifying typhoons, we're also working to deconstruct the negative stigma associated to farming so that young people can make a change in this industry. When we built our model, we built it around sustainability, community development, and a more equitable food system based on existing and rampant issues that we face here locally. We knew that a good future is a sustainable future, a future that treats farmers as partners and not as beneficiaries, especially in a country that marginalizes them in our food systems. So we have successfully worked with over 200 farmers, reforest about 85 hectares worth of trees over a span of uh, 85,000, um, planting 85,000 trees over a span of 85 hectares of land and restoring water sources in our area. But some of the things we learned along the way in doing this is first, um, you know, building this youth-led restoration-oriented venture is that we had to focus on a localized solution. Restoration is, is something that's kind of common to us all. The issues we face aren't unique to our region, but the social cultural contexts are, and it requires a deep understanding of the background and context of local traditional knowledge and lived experiences and cultures in order to sustain itself successfully as a systemic intervention. And secondly, in relation to this, we realized that it was not only important for young people to step forward and take the lead, but it was an industry that needed uh, intergenerational collaboration to fully achieve the full extent of our goal in rethinking food systems and harnessing the potential of our landscapes. We needed to approach mentors and people who have been in this industry for years. And thirdly, we know that in order to sustain a green recovery for our economy through restoration, we first had to tackle a mindset change. In countries like mine, farming is associated to poverty and unsustainability and failure. In fact, in schools, they teach school children that if you fail in your studies, you will end up as a farmer. And this mindset mm -hmm. keeps that system going, and it's absolutely tragic. So we knew that we had to destigmatize green jobs, agroforestry jobs, agricultural jobs, and we knew that it was absolutely essential for our economy to make sure that people are empowered to take on these roles. And instead as well, highlight how intersectional and how valuable it is for young people to lead the path of economic recovery through these industries and through revolutionizing these systems. So in the decade of ecosystem restoration, we need a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift involves young people working hand in hand with industry professionals to transform our food systems and change what was once deemed as unsustainable into an opportunity for regenerative and restorative intervention. So thank you, Luis. These are very uh, innovative ideas that you have uh, uh, brought into into this uh, topic, and also thank you for for mentioning also the the green recovery, which will become uh, uh, more and more important also in in the context of restoration, because also of course restoration can actually very quickly and uh, immediately uh, create jobs and and funding that is provided can of course uh, uh, quickly. Uh, brought to the ground. Now uh, to the final uh, speaker on, on our panel, Major, Major Sharma. Um, I, I see it's already dark in the place where, where you are, but I hope it's not too late that you can still tell us more a bit about Gratitude Farms and, and how your work is related to restoration and, and to, to make uh, restoration profitable. Please. Sure, Ulrich. Sure. Yeah, it's just about late evening in India. Thank you so much for having me on this panel. And it's an honor to be able to share what we are trying to do. We are small, but with very big aspiration. So Gratitude Farms, my company, we set it up essentially to help retired soldiers take up organic farming, natural precision farming. That was the idea with which we started. The idea was economic. It, is, it was to help the soldiers not to migrate to cities to take up uh, jobs in India like the security guards, menial jobs. And they have land and they used to leave it. So what we did was, I'm not from a farming background. I spent 16 years in army, 16 years in corporate sector, but farming was 
something I wanted to learn. So we traveled across the country, picked up some of the best practices. So today what Gratitude Farms does is that it synthesizes the traditional organic and natural farming practices and integrates it with technologies and most importantly, operational discipline at grassroots level. In India, at least I can say that one of the key things when you want to practice organic and natural farming, discipline is one of the key things. Nature demands discipline, right? If I were to put the work in what we are trying to do, we take up unused barren lands and convert them into very rich microbially carbon rich soil. It takes us six to nine months and then convert it into high yield, what we call the food forest model of uh, organic farming practice. It's a multi-cropping model. In one acre, we grow anything up to 100 fruit trees. And in three to four seasons, 10,000 vegetable plants and about 50,000 greens. The idea is one, when we take up unused land, we convert it into such a rich, uh, uh, first the soil and then the environmental uh, uh, system, environmentally rich system. And it is also aesthetic and very beautiful to look at. We have worked on systems, how to make it resilient to cyclones and pest attacks, etc., from the traditional practices. Now, this is the part that we started doing. And now what we are doing is we are expanding it. I was very mm -hmm. lucky to be part of the Land Accelerator program. And there, through the mentors, as well as through the pitch presentation, I could showcase what we can do in one or two acres of land. And we, have, we were very fortunate to get investors. Not only has investment come to me for replicating this particular model across many geographies within the South India where I'm operating, I've started receiving funding from private agri-sector financiers, thanks in no small measure to Land Accelerator Program. But another good thing that has happened is a lot of these agri-finance institutions have their own centers of excellence where they train people. They have asked us to set up and replicate the food forest model and all the value additions that we do. We also use solar drying and vermicomposting so that the biomass that we generate is reused and put back into the soil as carbon. So these are the two things that have happened in the last one year. One, we started attracting a lot of quality finance. And second, we are setting up centers of excellence for training farmers, ex-soldiers, rural women to take this up in a big scale. Thank you. Oh, that's that's very impressive. Thank you. That's very very impressive achievements for a, a small startup, and and really thank, thank you. you for sharing this very interesting case study. Uh, I have a few questions coming from the audience, so uh, let us now uh, turn to some questions, and let me start uh, with um, with Tommaso. A very interesting question to to Tommaso about. Uh, the investments in capacity building is capacity building only funded from the from the public sector or how can the private sector be engaged into capacity building for restoration uh, activities Tomaso, can you repeat the question uh, again can you, can, you, can you repeat the question yeah yes, it's about have, the I funding have. for capacity Push. building uh, is it only from the uh, public sector or also can the private sector fund capacity building right, for right right well um we are a very uh, critical example of that um as we uh, um funded our own uh capacity building to the um to the collectors mostly and then we received a grant from the uh, from the british government as i was saying to now capacitate allo farmers and further capacitate the the collectors but there is uh, i think is only beneficial for a private sector to invest in their own supply chain so our capacity building efforts which do not only stop with trainings but uh, give also and delivers fundamental equipment for harvesting and mm -hmm. sorting mm -hmm. and grading we we definitely um invest in our own supply chain as a private sector and i don't see mm -hmm. why other private sector wouldn't do it into i mean for the for the farms we do not own the land we want the communities to own the land um we we want community land to be restored we don't want to own but definitely when it comes to uh to, to collection and even other mm -hmm. 
um, capacity, capacity building exercises, we do it ourselves with our own funding. And it has mm -hmm. been um, definitely an effort. And thanks, thanks uh, um, to, 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 again, um, seed, seed investors, we've been able to do that ourselves. Yeah, no, thank you. That's, that's good to hear. I have um, another question for Cookie. Uh, what are the minimum economic indicators that enterprises need to show to qualify for, for the land accelerator? Can you tell us this quickly, the minimum indicators that you had to fulfill? If you, if you are on the, uh, still online. Just yes, I am. Okay, Hello? go ahead. Uh, go yes. ahead, if you need some support, let me know. No, 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 I'm okay. Uh, you see, what happens with the land accelerator, the first thing you have to do is, you know, just know when the session is open and, and, and apply. Uh, at the time when we, we got into the first cohort, one of the first or things you needed to do is at least you need to have had something started. So that's why you're called a startup. You needed to be either at the level where you're a startup or, or at the level where you have uh, worked and you're a medium sized company. So that's some of the things that we needed to be part of the land accelerator. And obviously you needed to have a startup business that is in line with landscape restoration. Like in our case, we grow bamboo, we grow bamboo uh, on, on plantations and also grow bamboo with farmers in degraded areas. So those are some of the main things that you needed. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Cookie. Uh, we are coming to the Just last- uh, A business that has to landscape restoration such as ourselves. Thank you, Cookie. We are coming to the last five minutes. Uh, of this session, um, maybe very, very quickly uh, to, to Luis, uh, what advice can you give to, to groups that are not involved in restoration, uh, that um, want to in, in involve in, in green techniques and agroforestry and so uh, these kind of techniques? I think that in terms of groups that are not involved in restoration, there's always a, a way to connect with restoration and environmentalism. There's always this interconnectivity with it. So whether it's starting to you know, have better um, facilities for green jobs or better um, kind of opportunities for young people to be involved and contribute and find ways to scale mm -hmm. in a sense that includes sustainability or a sustainability plan in the long term, whether it's within your office or within how you plan to move as forward as a business, because one day all of our businesses will have to be sustainable and green and everyone will have to start integrating that slowly but surely over the next decade. Thank you, Louise. I think that's, that's also a perfect uh, way to uh, end our session with a very positive message. Every initiative counts and uh, every idea, every innovative idea counts. Uh, so please go ahead and continue with the good work that you're all doing. And I thank you very much again for being on this panel and sharing your experiences. I hand now over back to, to Thais for a few uh, conclusive remarks of our session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Apple, and I hope you were he hearing me now. Yes, I think it is. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this was a very interesting discussion. I really thank all the, the, the participants. And uh, I just would like to highlight uh, the first thing is that uh, how many uh, good uh, um, examples we do have, uh, not only forestry, uh, but in agroforestry, farmers. Uh, so the potential for land restoration is really clear. And what is needed is uh, a real the, the finance to scale up uh, uh, this experience. Uh, we also uh, would like to highlight, as was uh, uh, discussed here, um, how it's important to have these facilities and, uh, and instruments to support the producers, not only uh, the, the financial collaboration, but also the technical collaboration to help them uh, to, to structure their business, to, to structure their activities in order uh, to receive finance. I think it's very clear as well, uh, the, the benefits that forest land restoration brings 
uh, to livelihoods, in particular to smallholders and uh, SMEs. Uh, the examples we just heard uh, in this last uh, uh, in this last uh, panel, uh, they are very clear on the very concrete uh, uh, results and benefits that uh, were generated by by the entrepreneur, uh, by the by the producers, and uh, and and this also shows uh, the value of local solutions uh, to, to 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 reach the resilience. Uh, and the, the, the climate adaptability. Um, uh, it's also important uh, in, this, in, this, in this discussion uh, to value uh, the, the local, again, the local experience also uh, based on this traditional knowledge uh, to make uh, uh, the, the adherence uh, and the possibility of participation of a, 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 a big, uh, the, 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 all the stakeholders uh, in this restoration efforts. Um, finally, I will just uh, 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 say that uh, uh, we had an announcement in the beginning of this panel uh, about this uh, learning guide. Uh, and the learning guide I just heard that is now online. It can be accessed, so uh, it will be uh, disseminated through uh, our network, the learning guide that was presented by uh, Mr. Bosler in the beginning uh, of this uh, of this session, I I really hope that you have learned as much as I did through these presentations that we had today. Um, understanding the economic side and understanding the way uh, producers, uh, private sector, how do the how the the, the restoration can fit into the bio economy and how these can connect and can can leverage. Uh, the participation of private sector uh, um, to this uh, important effort to of forest land restoration. I really hope that this panel has contributed to to this objective. There is a clear uh, business case for forest land restoration from whatever side you look. Uh, restoration is uh, 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 is an environmental. Uh, uh, um, it's an environmental need, uh, but it's also a, a, a very good uh, economic opportunity, social economic opportunity for us to build uh, the planet resilience that we need and the level of growth that we need to reduce inequality. So I really hope that uh, uh, you have enjoyed this panel and that you are all as excited as I am to continue to work on that and, and make uh, uh, the forest land restoration we need happen. Thanks a lot. Wow, absolutely wonderful panel. And in my native tongue or here on Guam, one way we like to show deep appreciation is we say, um, and so with that being said, to our speakers and presenters so far, we have contributed, you know, who have contributed valuable insights on restoration. Welcome to those who just joined. I'm your host, Rosario Perez. And today we're discussing approaches to scaling up forests and landscape restoration. Reminder that the hashtag for today is hashtag restore together. Let's have a look at some of the comments that have been popping up on social media. It's really great to see people tuning in from around the world. And from here, we have people from Nepal, Nigeria, Nicaragua. And here's a few comments that we found. Forestry can be transformational in generating green jobs. Another one, fantastic rapid presentations by the panel members and lots of online engagement. And we definitely love the online engagement, so keep them coming. And our last comment we're gonna spotlight Africa plays a major role in the fight against climate change through resilient forests and landscape restoration. Let's make a difference today for tomorrow. Absolutely to that comment. Well, without further ado, we will now have a short break. But before we do that, we're going to have a special message from Mundi Pontillo, Associate Director, Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program in Papua New Guinea. Community conservation champions of the Huen Peninsula, a model for community-based conservation in Papua New Guinea. 
Papua New Guinea's Huen Peninsula in Morobia province is an extremely rugged mountainous area rising from the famed coral triangle to 4,000 meters meter peaks and blanketed in one of the world's largest remaining cloud forests. The peninsula's Yopno Urua Som, or use for short, region is dotted with 50 remote villages home to 15,000 people who under Papua New Guinea's customary land tenure system collectively own and control their entire 1,600 square kilometer landscape, which is located at the back of this range of mountains here. These communities live a primarily subsistence lifestyle, relying on their natural resources and fertile soil just as their ancestors did for generations before them. However, community leaders in use noticed worrying challenges that previous generations had never experienced. Important resources were becoming scarce. As expressed by Matthew Tombe of Isan Village Use, and I quote, our hunters had to travel longer distances to find animals in the forests. Sometimes we had to hunt in the areas belonging to other clans without their consent because we could not find enough in our traditional land to feed our families, end of quote. The landowners of Use were determined to find a lasting solution and in 1996 met Dr. Lisa Dabek an Amer American con conservation biologist studying the endangered Matches tree kangaroo, endemic to the Huen Peninsula. Despite diverse perspectives and interests, they discovered a common objective, protecting the Matches tree kangaroo and its habitat. With this partnership, the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program was born. Over the years that followed, the used landowners Inspired by respected landowner Mambawe Mano, Manaono of Kambul village, traversed their landscape to advocate for conservation and sustainable use of their forests for the well being of future generations. Together with the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program, the landowner set an ambitious goal collecting land pledges from dozens of clans across use and creating the country's first nationally recognized conservation area. In 2009, with more than 78,000 hectares of land pledged, their goal was achieved and the youth conservation area was established. Matthew Tombe of Isan Village goes on to say, and I quote, with the creation of the youth conservation area and the support for conservation throughout youth, I am seeing a huge change. I am seeing animals just on the edges of the villages, the gardens, and even within village boundaries. More and more youth clans are pledging areas of their customary land for conservation so that they can contribute and benefit from these changes as well." End of quote. In the decade that followed, the the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program and the Youth Conservation Area have become a national model for conservation within the unique context of Papua New Guinea's customary land tenure system. With support from Global Environment Facility through the United Nations Development Program, the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program is building a cap the capacity of local communities and other stakeholders to manage the youth conservation area and responding to community needs, including sustainable livelihoods, education, and an integrated One Health approach, maintaining the health of the environment, the wildlife, and its people. As this well-respected mother, Annie Ogate of Yawan Village Youth states, and I quote, before the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Programs Youth Conservation Copy coffee project, we never got such good prices for our coffee. Families who have kids in school see this as an opportunity to offset the school fees from what we earn. This is such a big relief. In addition to the beliefs benefits for conservation, 
I can see parents now able to afford new clothes for their kids to wear to school. And families can even earn enough to keep small savings which are invested into equipment and materials for next year's harvest." End of quote. The youth conservation area is working. The forests and ecosystems are healthy. Key species like the Metis tree kangaroo are thriving in the protected areas. areas. The people of use are also benefiting from their actions, which have brought sustainable improvements to local livelihoods, as well as new opportunities for education and health. Thank you so much, Modi. We'll now take a short break. We'll see you a quarter past the hour for the next session. In the meantime, to learn more about topics being discussed today, check out the resources found in the session agenda. They are also being posted in the chat. See you all then.
Welcome back, everybody. And so for our last session of today's forum, it is my pleasure to introduce Tango Tameo, Principal Forestry Officer and AFR 100 National Focus, Focal Point at the International Union of Conservation of Nature, who will moderate the session on the role that forest and landscape restoration can play in conserving the world's biodiversity. Hello everyone, um, welcome to the third and final session today. Um, in this session, I have a panel of um, experts that will be sharing the, experience, the experiences with us. As I've been introduced, I am Tango Dumeo and uh, working with um, IUCN and based in Malawi. This session um, will examine the role restoration can play in conserving the world's biodiversity. Um, for help in exploring this very important and timely topic, I'm joined by uh, um, four uh, ladies and gentlemen um, who share their knowledge and experiences um, during the next few minutes. But first, before we go and um, have a discussion with the panelists, uh, we'll be joined by Jim. Um, Jim is serving as the chair, co-chair, the chair for the Society for Ecological Restoration, as well as the co-chair, the vice chair of the Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration. Jim will provide um, a context um, and understanding on the role of uh, a restoration um, in conserving world's biodiversity. Where does restoration fit? in alongside um, conservation measures uh, that are going on uh, across the globe. Why should we care um, as a forester myself? Why should I care? And what initiatives like the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration mean in terms of awareness and support uh, for restoration in, in addressing biodiversity crisis that um, we have across the globe? Uh, let allow me now to ask Jim uh, to come in um, in 10 minutes, for 10 minutes or so, and share uh, what he has for us. Welcome, Jim. Uh, thank you very much for the, the kind introduction, Tengu. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> a great pleasure to be able to discuss this um, uh, topic. It's one of great concern to me. And what I'd like to do is just give you a brief overview today uh, um, to uh, inform what should be an outstanding discussion by our distinguished panel and moderator. Uh, next slide, please. I thought I'd start by just considering what happens when natural systems are, are converted or degraded. Um, the most common outcome, of course, is that they become simplified. Um, this picture shows a manicured lawn, which likely replaced a more diverse assemblage of grasses and herbs and trees. And when uh, systems become simplified, then species are lost because essential uh, resources are no longer present. Uh, you can see that the loss of trees in this case has resulted in an altered animal behavior. But more commonly, what will occur is that there'll be a decline in numbers because resources aren't there. Uh, some species will be able to migrate to other areas. And this, of course, may create um, large aggregations of individuals, um, increasing encounters with humans. Um, and of course, uh, we also know that uh, more simplified or less biodiverse systems um, have a likelihood to have a, of increased disease vectors. Um, and this is because they tend to attract very generalized, often weedy species that can use a wide variety of resources. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that, that as we simplify systems, they often require uh, extreme inputs from us uh, they could be fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, and all of these may uh, in turn um, leave that particular area and go into, in effect, other um, uh, ecosystems. What brought me into ecology initially was just the interrelationships of different organisms. Um, they can be very complex and we're still learning a lot about them. Um, and uh, one example uh, concerns the, the movement of uh, seeds within tropical forest systems. We've known for quite a while that birds and bats can disperse seeds that um, then settle and grow. But we've recently uh, learned more about an, a much older interaction, at least science has, uh, that goes back probably 90 million years or so, which exists between fish and fruit-bearing trees in the floodplain forests of the Amazon. 
Uh, this large fish here can disperse the seeds of 100 tree species over hundreds of kilometers. Unfortunately, this fish is also uh, very tasty and is declining in some areas. Um, also, uh, dam creation has begun to limit its ability to disperse. So we can anticipate changes in this forest system if that um, species is allowed to um, decline severely. Um, we could maintain the forest um, through human intervention, but that would be hugely difficult and expensive to do. The global community has recognized the problem of land degradation and, and the loss of biodiversity. The numbers are quite sobering, um, uh, including uh, recent uh, numbers produced by uh, IPBES. But the recognition of this problem has led to the establishment of restoration goals for biodiversity, uh, both for the Convention on Biological Diversity and the European Union, which uh, hope to restore 15% of degraded lands by 2020. And we'll see what the post-2020 framework looks like, but we can expect that restoration will be uh, part of that. We have commitments to restore over 350 million hectares of, of forest land by 2030 through the bond challenge and the New York Declaration. And of course, um, uh, restoring uh, systems that are no longer functioning um, ecologically um, it has great relevance for the sustainable development goals. And I'm very pleased that the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration launch, launching this year becomes really an umbrella to support all of these um, uh, programs. So let's consider um, the role of restoration now in maintaining uh, ecological health and the integrity of, of systems. And I'm going to turn here to um, some principles developed uh, or presented by the Global Partnership on Forest and Landscape uh, Restoration and uh, share just a few. Uh, the first, as the name suggests, is a focus on Jim, landscape. We are not seeing your next slides. Oh. Um, we are seeing the first one. Oh, shoot. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to, to um, have them go. Um, can you, next slide, please. Uh, these are the range of um, uh, programs um, uh, calling for restoration. Next slide, please. And here, here we have the, the, the focus on landscapes. Um, I'm, my apologies for not um, uh, communicating better. Um, so many ecosystem processes really function at uh, large scales, whether it's a landscape or, or watershed. Um, and also, uh, so do uh, degradation processes. Um, we can certainly uh, become active in attempting to restore uh the the species assemblages on individual sites but uh, forest and landscape restoration really takes place within and across entire landscapes and these can be mosaic um opportunities as shown in the lower part of the slide uh where there's a mixture of agriculture uh, grazing and we may um, have degraded um, systems to that um, affect uh, our restoration projects we could have um protected areas of forest and degraded uh, forests as well. Uh, but we need to understand this uh, full framework. Next slide, please. We know too that ecological restoration gains uh, value when it's applied at large scales. Uh, in fact, uh, some species have space requirements that can't be met by small scale projects unless they provide a link or corridor within a larger program or two protected areas. Uh, an example here is the, the uh, jaguar, a large uh, carnivorous cat uh, found in the Atlantic forest of Brazil. Um, it has really large space requirements. Um, it um, over you know, 1,000 uh, square kilometers um, uh, preferred. And the fragmentation of the forest in, in uh, this area has led to their absence from uh, areas that would otherwise be uh, suitable to them. Next slide, please. The 
uh, goal of restoration is really um, to tailor to the local context and using a variety of, of approaches. Uh, this uh, graph came from the Society for Ecological Restoration uh, standards um, for ecological restoration. And um, we can use a variety of approaches. That's why the UN decade is so exciting uh, because people can use them to reduce impacts um, in cities. Uh, but as we think about larger systems, we're trying to uh, move across this continuum to the right where we can uh, regain the most ecological value. But of course, any, <laughs> any intervention that reduces uh, degradation and increases biodiversity uh, will be of value. And so we wanna use um, the latest science and best practices um, that are available, incorporate traditional and indigenous knowledge and apply it to the context of the local capacities of, uh, and uh, existing uh, governance structures. Next slide, please. Uh, this um, graph shows uh, the uh, possibilities for restoring multiple functions for multiple benefits and uh, bringing in stakeholders and support. It's a project in Cordillera Azul National Park in Peru. Uh, there's a large protected area that um, uh, protects um, a number of, of rare and uh, endangered um, species. It acts as a carbon sink. Um, and in the periphery of the national park is a buffer zone really of 35 uh, communities, uh, over 5,000 people, which uh, through activities of restoration are able to uh, have sustainable livelihoods, um, the production of uh, clear, clean water, um, other uh, services that are important uh, to uh, benefit them. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, a, a final um, component is that uh, we want to maintain and enhance the natural ecosystems within landscapes. And so uh, what this means is that we don't uh, convert or destroy uh, additional natural ecosystems so restoration is not a, a, a tool um, that um, can simply uh, replace um, uh, an, a damaged uh, uh, ecological area. Um, and it also requires a considerable amount of time to uh, pursue. And we know that repair and recovery um, is off, often incomplete. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, I wanna mention that res restoration is forward looking. Um, we're trying to assist ecosystems to return to a trajectory that they would be on had degradation or disturbance not happened. So that uh, incorporates two things. One is that we're unlikely to return to some previous state, but also we need to uh, deal with issues of climate change, which are going to prevent barriers to uh, some species uh, uh, taking their place in the, the ecosystem. And again, I'm very excited that the UN decade has provided a great platform for communicating the need for restoration and recognition that we can only restore um, uh, ecosystems and increased biodiversity through collaboration provides a great, we have a great opportunity at this point in time, and it's a very hopeful process. This word tree was produced by um, a collaboration between uh, SER, uh, the Global Partnership, uh, the IUCN um, uh, Commission on Ecosystem Management, uh, through a, a forum held recently where uh, participants were asked to provide um, their two words on restoration. And so, um, uh, last slide, please. Uh, 
Thank you all very much. And I look very uh, much forward to the discussion to follow. Thank you very much, Jim, for that great presentation. You've really set the stage um, for everyone to recognize the fact that uh, restoration has a big role in conserving biodiversity. We have to understand that it's all about enhancing the natural ecosystems and maintaining the natural ecosystems, because we do not want to lose out what was already existing by um, really redefining what the uh, ecosystems and landscapes are. At this point in time, uh, we are going to go into we're going to go deeper into the discussion um, with the panel of uh, the experts that we have for us to get a, a better understanding, learning from the experiences, what ways um, restoration can help us um, conserve biodiversity. We'll explore how restoration can address um, and can, can address and reduce the threats um, that are there now to the to biodiversity and the limitations that the, the various approaches that we are currently using have um, in us achieving that goal. We have to also look at how do we balance uh, the competing objectives in the landscape. Jim did um, present a, a, a picture of a landscape when we're talking about the mosaic landscapes. There are various land uses that are, that are there when we're, when we're encountering landscapes. How do we balance all that? Um, the panel is composed of four experts. Um, we have Anita, Anita Diaz Derrickson is a bio biologist and is, she's currently working with WWF as a global lead for forest landscape restoration. She's also the coordinator of WF, WWF's area of collective action and innovative community. Anita is uh, the focal point uh, and member of the steering committee of the Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration. She's also a member of IUFRO Task Force on Transforming Forest Landscapes for Future Climates and uh, Human Wellbeing. Um, among others, she's also coordinator for the initiative 2020 Policy and Legislative Task Force. Allow, us, allow me also to introduce Victoria. Victoria Gutierrez is the head of global policy at Common Land, which is a foundation that enables and catalyzes large-scale large holistic landscape restoration worldwide. She's a senior land use change and landscape restoration expert. Uh, with experience in strategy formulation and science policy uh, practice integration in the international NGO sector. Uh, the next panelist, uh, we're going to be joined by Lois Mayer. Lois Mayer is a postdoctoral researcher at Newcastle University in UK. She's currently working on species conservation science and policy, and, and she's also an active member of the IUCN SSC Post 2020 Biodiversity Task Force which is aiming at informing species conservation targets in the conservation uh, in the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. She collaborates with colleagues across IUCN um, and engages directly with policymakers through the CBD. And lastly, but not least, we have Vance Martin. He's an innovative leader uh, known for bringing the interests of people and nature. He has lived extensively overseas, worked in over 55 countries and helped to establish many nonprofit organizations in this area. He's also an acknowledged expert in international nature conversation and wilderness protection, including strong friendships and working partnerships with traditional um, indigenous and community leaders. So you can tell by um, that introduction that we have a lot of experience and uh, areas to discuss. Meanwhile, uh, let me ask the audience to send in their questions, uh, which we'll look at after we've had a few minutes to, to delve further and have and talk with the experts. My first question will go to Victoria. Um, People seem to think of restoration as some set of activities um, involving tree planting um, and other greening measures. But of course, restoration, as we've also heard from Jim, is more than tree planting. Help us understand what practitioners are referring to as an expert yourself when they use the word restoration, uh, how restoration can potentially impact uh, threatened biodiversity. Uh, Victoria. Thank you, Tango. Um, I'm really sorry uh, for the last minute uh, technical issues with my camera, um, but I'm really um, happy to join you and others uh, in this uh, session today, looking at this very important uh, matter of um, promoting biodiversity conservation and uh, 
um, within landscapes uh, restoration. So um, tree planting, uh, when done appropriately, uh, the right species, the right density, the right place is of course one of the tools that restoration practitioners have at their disposal to restore degraded ecosystems, but it's, it's only one of the tools in the toolbox. Restoration, um, particularly um, at landscape level, is not achieved through a single set of activities. Um, and it can involve uh, multiple activities and processes that serve different restoration functions and objectives over time and, and space. So at, at Common Land, for example, we operate uh, at a 20 year time frame, minimum 20 year time frame, because we recognize that tree growth and ecosystem recovery takes time. So it's important to think long term and therefore uh, avoid quick fixes that uh, may not lead uh, or yield the, the expected uh, results that we would like to see. And uh, in terms of spatial scale of restoration activities that promote biodiversity can also take place across different types of land use within the landscape. And that in itself may call for different types of restoration actions or techniques or, or processes. So within protected areas of high biodiversity value, we may uh, engage in adding new species that, that are missing, or we may promote natural regeneration, or we may use a variety of, 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 of tools um, to, to promote uh, biodiversity. But also, and I think this is, this is quite important because we, all, we sometimes forget uh, about the importance of working and promoting uh, on bi biodiversity outside these conservation areas or these high uh, biodiversity value areas. Um, and these are areas where we can uh, connect biodiversity promotion with other uh, uh, objectives such as agricultural production in, um, that, that can be done in sustainable ways. And, and that means that we can um, uh, work on identify synergies. Um, for example, there, there are big movements that focus on regenerative agriculture or practices that involve agroforestry that happen outside these, um, these conservation areas. And this matters because uh, there are vast areas that are not dedicated to conservation. So we need to bring and, and use and leverage these areas in, in a way that we can expand, uh, extend the uh, conservation buffer zones, but also possibly create uh, ways in which we can connect landscapes, um, um, you know, connect different fragments of, of ecosystems that, that have come, become isolated. And therefore restoration in, in, in a nutshell involves a whole range of actions and considerations that can promote biodiversity uh, and, uh, and conservation of, of high, um, threatened species. Thank you very much, Victoria, for that um, elaboration. Yes, um, you've mentioned the fact that we have to think uh, long term. Um, you've also uh, emphasized the fact that we have to consider the scale um, and the fact that it's, there is no one size fits all. Of course, there are a variety of interventions that have to be matched with the various land uses that we have across uh, the various landscapes. Um, now I'll move on to Anita, and then um, I'll also ask Louise to weigh in a little bit on, um, on, on the question of, are there some species and threatened biodiversity for which restoration is essential to their survival and persistence? Uh, let's start with Anita. Hello, thank you very much for being here. It's a great pleasure. So first, I think we need to consider that at the moment we are talking about more than some species which survival depend on restoration. We are facing a dramatic decline in species populations on land as presented by the Living Planet Report. And the main cause is habitat loss and degradation, including deforestation. And it's also known that a large percentage of species in the IUCN red list of threatened species are threatened with habitat loss or degradation. So in this context means that there are several species to be considered and FLR implementation needs to prioritize areas where to have greater biodiversity benefit and for example crucial areas for ecological connectivity and close to protect areas. 
So in this perspective, for landscape restoration and ecosystem restoration provides an opportunity to, to broadly improve the conditions of species and ecosystem and to reduce threats and pressures to biodiversity at scale of hundreds of millions of hectares worldwide. So we need to work aiming to bring habitat back to a large percentage of species as several of them are under threat. And I would love also to hear now Louis' uh, perception on this uh, uh, question, please. Yeah, thanks, Anita. So that, that's a really nice high level overview you've given. So to give a really specific example and put that in context, if we think about the Javan rhino, um, it was driven to really small population size because of poaching. But now that it is a small population, it exists with only a sing within a, only a single national park. Um, and within that national park, the habitat quality has actually declined over time. And in part, that's due to invasive species, but it's also due to human encroachment. So that's a really clear example. We've got high profile species on the brink of extinction, where restoration activities within its existing habitat could increase the carrying capacity, increase the population size of the species. But then within adjacent areas, restoration activities for that species could allow it to expand its population size, which would reduce its extinction risk. So we can take these high level principles of needing to restore habitat for lots of species and target areas where we've got critically endangered species and where the action that can be taken for them could also benefit all the other species existing within the same habitat. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, I'll move to the next question, which is almost um, complementary to what you have just discussed. Vance, um, I'll, I'll, I'll please come in with um, responses to the question where we're looking at, I mean, based on your experience having worked in over 55 countries, what are some success stories um, that you can point towards um, where restoration has helped in conservation trade and biodiversity to add on to what Anita and Louise have just shared? Thank you, uh, Tengu, and thanks to my uh, fellow panelists. Um, I have worked uh, uh, a long time in, in many different countries, lived and, and worked, though uh, we are based in the States at the moment, um, uh, the uh, Wild Foundation. But for sake of time, I think I'll concentrate success stories on uh, a project in which we've been involved in Mali, in central Mali, um, because it really, uh, it really demonstrates uh, the impact of large-scale restoration, working across multiple ethnicities, bringing multiple benefits, really rings the bell on so many of the forest landscape restoration principles. Um, mm. So this is a large area in central, central Mali called the Gorma. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that our, our work there has been at the invitation of the Mali government and the local communities. Uh, our team is entirely uh, in country, is entirely um, Malian. Uh, uh, there's only one expat involved, uh, the very talented Dr. Susan Canney, who directs the project, but uh, the work is all done by Malians. And I think that principle is one of the most important ones for success of any restoration or rewilding project. Um, this is based around a herd of, uh, the only herd of Sahelian elephants. Um, and what we learned, because this project is a, is a, a social science-based ecological restoration and community empowerment project. So we use as much, if not more, social science as we do ecological science. And we worked for two years when we first started without doing anything except talking to the local people. We wanted to find out, do they want the elephants? And you know, they do. And we found a great deal of local ecological knowledge, uh, call it wisdom, I, I call it science, because um, they know, in fact, we had direct quotes, if the elephants are not here, then the environment is not good for us. But what more plain science knowledge important can you, can you have? Um, so uh, over the course of some years, um, uh, working with uh, the principles of local empowerment, so, social science, and political permissions at all levels, 
Um, the multiple benefits of uh, large landscape restoration, uh, the government has uh, agreed to expand this um, uh, uh, protected area into a biosphere reserve model. It's, it's uh, to in, in incorporate uh, 1.25 million hectares, uh, greatly expanded from the original reserve. Um, women's empowerment groups are um, utilizing local plants, uh, realizing uh, revenue in an organized manner because the local people don't see a difference between sustainable management and revenue. Both of those are benefits because by taking care of the environment and restoring it where necessary, they, they live healthier lives and they know that. So it, it doesn't take complicated science. So there are multiple benefits to multiple communities because we have 13 ethnicities all working together. Um, so there's a little piece of a very big uh, success story and I'm glad to answer questions later or relate some smaller examples too. Thank you, Tengu. Thank you very much, Vance, for bringing in the people side of um, restoration and biodiversity con con conservation, having had the the meaning of um, the definition of restoration, having looked at um, the various species that are under threat, and also um, learning from the various success stories. Now, let us go back to, um, to Victoria. Um, now to have a, a brief on what the principles and approaches are um, that are currently being applied to ensure that restoration um, is helping to reduce and alleviate threats to biodiversity. Victoria. Thank you, Tango. Um, I think some of the uh, the important principles that uh, that apply to um, large scale um, restoration has have, have already been mentioned. So. Uh, Jim referred to multiple functions and objectives. Uh, um, I heard Vance talk about the importance of, of participatory processes and, and bottom-up approaches and uh, uh, thinking about benefit sharing. Um, so there's a whole range of, of, of important principles that we need to uh, consider in, in uh, integrating in, in order to have balanced uh, results that work for uh, the various objectives that we're trying to meet, uh, but also for a range of stakeholders that are involved at, at, large, scale, at large scale level. Um, a very uh, recent study has shown that if you ask uh, experts in ecological restoration about what, what the main uh, barriers in, in their views uh, in, in, in the coming years, most of these, the 12 main reasons, um, um, the 12 most uh, important barriers are not ecological and, and they're not biophysical. They, they are actually uh, socioeconomic. So I think one of the important aspects that sometimes could be seen as more daunting are those that uh, relate to, to the participatory uh, and inclusive governance uh, principles and to those that that work towards creating a uh, fairer and uh, uh, and um, yeah self-driven in, in, in some ways bottom-up approaches. So so I think these are, are quite important, uh, although quite uh, more complicated because of course the, these are the human elements that that make it um, that make it very uh, difficult. Um, so finding a way in which we can uh, balance these multiple um, social, cultural, financial, economic and biodiversity uh, priorities is, I think, uh, one of the important approach that we need to take to be able to succeed in, in, all, of these, um, uh, in all of these areas. Thank you very much, Victoria, for highlighting the fact that indeed governance principles everywhere, um, where you are talking about the human element, as you've mentioned, becomes very important because, I mean, science, science has taught us all these lessons, but when you have to go and implement those, you need the willingness of the people, you need the participation of the people, you need to include all the necessary um, community members and uh, relevant stakeholders for you to really achieve the goals that you want to, to achieve. Of, of course, as you aim at balancing uh, the various priorities that communities have. 
at this point, um, as we move Tengu, on in the discussion. Tengu, yes. Do you mind if I just compliment with some very quickly additional points here on the principles and the approaches? Go ahead, let me, I'll give you a minute. Okay, thank you very much. So to complement what Victoria said, I think it's important to mention that the four landscape restoration principles, they work very well when we use the landscape approach to implement that it's a participatory process that takes place to together stakeholders and plan actions towards a common vision and under a long term process. Also, I, I would like to mention the Restoration Opportunity Assessment Methodology, known as ROAM, that was developed by UCN and WR, that has been a very useful methodology to help us to plan large scale uh, for landscape restoration. Also, the Society for Ecological Restoration developed the international principles and standards for the practice of ecological restoration. The Conservation Measure Partnerships developed the conservation standards, and now the UN DACA is developing the principles. So I would just uh, brought them because all of them can be used to lead to better results for biodiversity conservation through restoration. So thank you. Thank you very much for that addition. Indeed, yes, we have a vast um, range of um, written published documentation. Um, materials in terms of what we can what we can follow as guidelines, as you have mentioned, and uh, the main th the main um, takeaway from what you have just said also um, touches on the common vision. It's indeed most uh, very important to have a common vision wherever we are um, restoring uh, landscapes for for biodiversity conservation. Um, let us uh, let us bring back uh, Vance to discuss the the various trade offs. Uh, that must be managed in order to balance the objectives um, of different land users, having talked about balancing of priorities in various uh, landscapes where we have different land uses. How do you, um, how do you manage those trade-offs? Well, um, thank you, Tengu. Um, there's always, tr there's always trade-offs. And uh, I think um, uh, a very simple principle that facilitation is not dictation. And um, I think it's very important to, um, to bring uh, multiple ethnicities, uh, multiple levels of governance together. Uh, in the case I was giving in Mali, um, one of the key uh, 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 things we had to work out uh, was the devolution of national power to local power, which uh, took some years, but our Malian partners um, achieved that because you need to work at multiple levels. And um, there are laws, there are resource laws, but once that occurred in the case of the Gorma um, and uh, power over natural resources was devolved to local com communities, the biodiversity um, impacts became evident very, very quickly because people knew that they had to care for their resources. So forest cover uh, increased, uh, water increased, uh, the local people could uh, bring a levy on the prestige herds. These are the herds that are not local, they're large herds uh, managed by transhumant uh, herders, um, owned by very wealthy people, utilizing local resources at the cost of local people. The devolution turned that around. So the people could control their forest resources, forest improved. They could control their water resources, water improved. Water improved, birds came back in, more gazelles in the landscape, less human wildlife conflict with the elephants. Um, so that, that's one of the big trade-offs. Um, there, there are many, but um, facilitation takes time, takes patience, and it takes love for the people. Because when people know that you care for them and that you're there for them, uh, it works so much better. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, from what you have just said, it, it really emphasizes that we have to think long term and yes. there will have to be trade-offs because people have different interests on the landscape. So how we manage that determines the final um, um, the final result that we get out of uh, the restoration interventions that we're having. Louise, you've been quiet for a while. Let me put you on the spot a little bit. Um, what 
new technology uh, and approaches do practitioners and policymakers now have at their disposal that they can potentially help better design restoration work and set science-based targets um, for nature so that we're getting all we can from conservation investments, having considered all these other things that we have discussed um, in this on this panel. Um, yeah, so we heard from Anita that we've got lots of guidelines of how to implement restoration activities. Um, but one of the things that can be really difficult is actually quantifying what the expected benefits to biodiversity are likely to be. So the latest tool that we've had developed um, tries to really address this. It's called the Species Threat Abatement and Restoration Metric or STAR metric. And basically what this allows you to do is to quantify the potential reduction in species extinction risk that you're likely to get through abating threats and carrying out habitat restoration activities at any particular site. Um, so the STAR metric has been developed by um, a group of more than 80 conservation experts and scientists globally. Um, and one of the strengths is that it draws on the IUCN Red List, which is basically our most comprehensive um, data set of species extinction risk globally. So we've now got more than 130,000 species assessed in the Red List. And STAR takes the information from the Red List and tells you which threatened and near threatened species you expect to find at a particular site and importantly what the threats are that are facing those species at that site and you can use that information to help determine what kind of restoration activities would be most beneficial for biodiversity at the site so you can use that to help in planning or you could also use it to complement the plans that you've already got in place so if your objectives are really much more socio-economic you can still use that metric to say, okay, we're doing this for the local community, but at the same time, we know we're getting some biodiversity benefits. How big are they? And you can use the STAR metric to make those kind of quantifications. Um, and we're trialing STAR at the moment, and um, we're applying it to a range of project sites um, across countries in Africa and Asia as well, working with IUCN. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to share those results soon. But the idea really is to put this information to help people make decisions into the, to, into the hands of the practitioners who are actually going to plan and then implement these restoration strategies. Thank you very much. Um, having mentioned the STAR metric, um, I think having I've looked at what it does, um, it's very important because as you are approaching inv potential investors um, in restoration, you will have to measure. I mean, we, we do the same for carbon, uh, for climate change, where you have the 2%, uh, 2 degrees Celsius target um, on, tied to climate change. We don't have the same for biodiversity. So it is going to be very important um, for countries, for organizations, for policymakers to have that uh, measured as well for biodiversity for us to have specific goals and relevant um, interventions implemented for us to achieve uh, restoration where we're also um, achieving conservation of biodiversity. Um, allow me to go back to Victoria now um, to look at what kind of partnerships um, are needed to help ensure restoration achieve its potential in helping to protect and restore biodiversity. We've talked about a lot of things, but who has to talk to who? Who has to be part of the discussion? Um, share with us, Victoria. Um, thank you, uh, Tango. Um, so uh, we very much live in an interconnected world and uh, as we move um, forward with uh, many of these very ambitious uh, initiatives, uh, we know that we have to do this in, in partnership. And it means that we will be connecting with, with perhaps more uh, traditional partners and less traditional partners. And it very much covers all sectors um, because we recognize that uh, restoration, particularly at landscape level, is, is a social economic, but also financial and cultural uh, activity. And so it does require actors of all um, backgrounds and, and mindsets and, uh, and uh, sectors um, and across different levels uh, as well. So um, I think when it comes to partnership um, creation, 
there is um, there is a, a choice we can make about the type of investment and commitment that we're willing to make uh, to this partnership. And this type of decision impacts on the type of partnership we then uh, eventually create and, and, and what we uh, ob obtain uh, eventually. For common land, because we take a long-term perspective approach, we um, take the approach that partnerships are at the very core and, and should be the very first step um, in um, creating, um, you know, in, in initiating restoration initiatives. And this is because if you invest in partnerships that, uh, you know, people with very different mindsets, with very different interests, uh, with very different skills, uh, bringing them together requires that you're able to build um, a minimum level of trust that you um, get to know each other, that you uh, build uh, transparency, uh, that there is a uh, process of um, sharing, um, developing a, a common vision, that these partners start um, co-creating and, and co-developing and co-implementing. So this is a, a very uh, important aspect of the work that, um, that Common Land supports. And it does mean uh, a lot of work. It means uh, additional co commitment and, and investment in all these various activities that can create opportunities for, uh, for these processes. Um, but at, in the long term, if we're really looking towards uh, a long term restoration, then I think this is, this is a, a very much needed uh, process. What we do is um, to be able to negotiate these, the, the disparity and the discrepancies within that might emerge and uh, you know, the, the various trade-offs that, uh, uh, that, that can happen. Uh, we rely on, on social uh, technology, um, social apps, and, and we base these on Theory U. Uh, which is very much a tool to, to navigate and negotiate in a systematic way uh, across all these various issues that, that can build towards uh, uh, bringing people together. And if you manage this, I think it can create the conditions for long-term com commitment. If this is well done, it can create a deeper shared meaning and uh, can very much uh, serve as a driving force for restoration action. And it can lead to inspiration. And, uh, and for common land, uh, inspiration is, is extremely important because People in landscapes need to be inspired uh, and this in, in itself makes them better uh, able to, to manage and respond adaptively and uh, importantly respond cohesively. Um, so, so this is, um, yes, yeah, so I, I think this is sort of uh, my um, contribution to, to this topic. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, for that contribution. Yes, we need to, do, to work together to do more. I mean, we can only improve on efficiency and effectiveness through the various collaborations that can be built um, from the, uh, and we have plenty of opportunity for us to do that um, in terms of establishing partnerships for us to achieve more. Before um, I allow each one of you to make your closing remarks, allow me to ask a question from the audience. Um, um, I will ask each one of you to indicate, to come in uh, and, and weigh in on this one. It says, what is more important for conservation, conserving biodiversity, restoration or conservation? Let me repeat that. What is more important for conserving biodiversity? Is it restoration or conservation? Tangum, I, I, I can reply here a little bit. I think what is more important is to look to the forest landscape restoration, because when we think about the concept of forest landscape restoration, everything is in there. So we don't need to think about what is most important, if it's conservation or restoration. We just need to do and take care well of our landscape, and then everything is going to be in there, all the actions, conservation and restoration. Thank you very much. The other one is saying, what can people who want to get more involved in restoration and help stop the loss of biodiversity uh, do? Where are some places to go and actions we take, uh, perhaps in our own backyards? Um, I think that one um, goes upon everybody. We all have to take a responsibility. There are all these materials available. There's all this um, range of knowledge that is now available for us uh, on restoration and conservation of biodiversity. Let us take advantage of all these techniques, all these tools, all these guidelines, all these 
standards and principles that have been developed uh, for us to engage more, learning from what the panelists have said uh, for us to do better and achieve uh, uh, conservation of biodiversity through restoration. Um, I'll give each one of you 30 seconds. I'm going to be very mean with the time. <laughs> Starting with Anita, since you were just here. Um, okay. Any concluding remarks? 30 seconds. Yes. So now, as we enter the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, we need to be able to be ready to act towards for landscape restoration implementation in a scale never done before. We in WWF have a, a very positive attitude, and we do believe that by joining our forces, it will be possible to bend the curve of biodiversity loss and climate change. Mm -hmm. And it's our responsibility to do all that we can for that. We need a global new deal for nature and people to set us on the path of recovery for to, uh, 2030. So thank you very much and let's restore together. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I would add to what uh, Hanita said, of course, that uh, we need to think big, uh, we need to think long term, and we must find ways in which we can integrate biodiversity priorities with other objectives. So thinking holistically uh, and uh, thinking about leveraging synergies across the economic, the social, the cultural objectives. This is very much at the heart of the work that Commonland does. And I'll be happy to, to share any um, further information, details, or invite anyone who, who may have a question uh, to, to reach out. And happy to share some, some links here. Thank you. Louise? Um, so really sticking with those themes, the idea that we need to scale up and we need to be ambitious, we heard from Vance um, the importance of local decision making. So the restoration activities really do have to happen with that local input. But what we need are the tools to be able to add up what all these different local initiatives mean at a larger scale. We need to know what's happening across landscapes and across nations so that we can see where we're doing well, but we can also see where the gaps are so that landscapes, biodiversity, communities aren't being left behind. Um, and that's where tools like STAR can come in and other initiatives as well so we can get that bigger picture to see how well we're doing at scale. Thank you very much. And lastly, Vance. Thank you. Um, I want to give a shout out to the Bond Challenge. Um, you know, 60 countries, all, all of them also signatories to the Convention on Biodiversity. Uh, very important for the Bond Challenge to be worked into the post-2020 framework. Also want to say that our work globally is through the Global Rewilding Alliance. 130 members, it's brand new, only been going for a few months. It's growing like, uh, like crazy and wonderful, uh, implementing partner of the, of the decade. Um, and I'll just end by saying, and this touches the question from the audience, we're a rewilding um, a global initiative, but our tagline, <clears throat> pardon me, is protect, restore, rewild. The greatest benefits, come from protecting the bits of wilderness, wild nature, and high biodiversity areas that are left. Good for climate, good for people, good for biodiversity. But then we restore. We need large-scale restoration, and we need to rewild our souls and rewild our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franz. Uh, this brings us to the end of today's session, where we were discussing the role that biodiversity plays in conserving the world's um, diversity, uh, the role of restoration, conserving biodiversity. I've really enjoyed um, and learned a lot more today, uh, listening to you all um, with your experiences and expertise on this topic. Um, we've heard and we've learned, and this is the message that we need to take um, along as we, we go out of this session. Um, how restoration can play a critical role to drive the protection and preservation of uh, threatened species alongside all other uh, demands um, and measures uh, that we are applying in our various landscapes. So I would like to thank you all very much uh, for your wonderful contributions. And of course, I would also like to thank the audience, everyone that has been listening in. Um, and in, I encourage also everyone to reach out uh, to the panel um, through the contacts that will be given, but also check out all the organizations' websites for, the, for more information on what they're doing. We have IUCN, WWF, 
Common Lands World Foundation, and other more information that is available uh, for all of us to engage more on this issue. Um, at this point in time, Jim, do you want to say something for a minute before I hand over to Polina? Sure, thank you, uh, Tengu. Uh, yes, I'm delighted to hear the conversation today and um, uh, glad that the, the panelists highlighted some of the really important uh, issues, including uh, scaling up uh, the need for uh, really engaging stakeholders from the start um, prior to initiating projects. Um, but we have a, a wonderful decade ahead and I hope we can accomplish quite a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. At this point, allow me to turn over uh, to Lina Po from FAO, who will provide closing remarks um, on today's digital forum. Over to you, Lina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tango. It's a um... It's a very, it's a great pleasure to be here, to hear all of you, uh, to know that there are a great community around the restoration, a platform, which is very important in, in this issue. So thank you, thank you so much for giving me the honor to, to speak this. And I want to highlight five points at this closing of this extraordinary forum. As all the speakers said, it, it is not possible to just discuss, to talk. You have to think and you have to act and to make of the restoration a, a successful event, to scale up all these fantastic um, experiences. However, it has meant a lot a lot to discuss the restoration programs around the world. We need to discuss that. We need to know about the successful stories and those that have failed, to know what our role is and what is not our role. It cannot be a program driven by the Ministry of Environment in a country, not even by a government. It has to be a national program where all the actors uh, should be involved. But it is too, it's true, to implement a restoration program, you must think first. Establish a, a general action framework and define the instruments, regulation, and necessary incentive. And for me in this forum, and in my previous experience, we are not alone. I mean, FAO, WRI, IUCN, WWF, and uh, among others, has played a central and fantastic role. And also countries like Germany, they have extraordinary capacities for helping to the countries to develop a program based on information. This is very important. So, we need to know about the sites to be restored, the inputs that should be used, the technique, the techniques that should be used, actors that should be involved, monetary systems that allows to define if we are on the right track or the changes we must do to achieve our objective have been decided. So we need also to elaborate an economic and financial analysis of the restoration, a cost benefit, showing that it's more convenient from an economic and financial point of view to invest in the restoration and recover of critical or key ecosystem services for the territory. Even now, it is more important now because of the pandemic we need to create uh, jobs and we need to recover all of this. So this is very important. And restoration allows the mainstreaming in productive sector, highlighting the importance of forest ecosystem and their services, 
to the ecosystem in general to achieve stability in the territories and reduction of vulnerability. Doing this peace treatment is a matter of country viability. And the restoration um, and ecosystem of ecosystem and landscape adopts, must adopt a synergic approach between the agendas in biodiversity, climate change, and land degradation, achieving local and global benefit. And it make us more resilient, help us reduce risks, provides water, and allow us to achieve the goals that we have as a country in, in all international commitments. So we need to integrate all this agenda, working together. Bond Challenge, the Global Landscape Forum, and so other are extraordinary platforms, as I say at the beginning. We need this platform. We need to improve. We need to be part of this platform. So I would like to, to issue a challenge. Each of us will have to engage 10 actors, keeping in mind that there are no small or big actors, no friends or enemies in this effort. Everyone must be incorporated, government, the private sector, academia, civil society organization, the media, and the people also. We need to inspire them to do it in a good way, because it's about our future, and not only our future, it's about our present. It's about now, what we can do, and, and how can we transform into and, re, and recovery from this pandemic in a transformational way. So we need to do it now. It's a sense of urgency. We have a decade, I know it is a long-term effort, but we have a decade to demonstrate that everything is possible. We need to do it now. And actually, at the end of this forum, I believe that we can do it. And we are going to do it. We are going to prove that restoration is the solution and the restoration um, is possible with, with this community and to incorporate more and more people, especially women, because we are smarter and we are a fighter. <laughs> we are. And also the indigenous community and the vulnerable people who have a key role to play here in this restoration program. So act now is a sense of urgency we are ready. We have all the knowledge to do it. So we have to act now. So thank you so much. It has been a, a fantastic forum, a pleasure to hear all of the experiences. Um, it's an inspirational time. So thank you, Tango. Thank you, guys. Thank you, the Global Landscape Forum, uh, my favorite platform <laughs> to do this. So. Thank you so much. Sidzo Smaasit Lina for your closing remarks. It's an honor to hear from one of the key architects and earliest supporters of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. In light of hearing all of these inspirational talks and dialogues and quotes and everything, that concludes our program for today. A big thank you for those tuning in from around the world and your active participation on social media. We have to give a shout out to the almost 2,000 people that registered for this event and well over 3,000 people from 109 countries from around the world that joined us today through live streams across social media and the web. So far, the event has reached over 2 million people on social media with over 1,300 posts on the restoration and 10,500 comments, reactions, and questions. How beautiful. Participation from the people is power from the people and to the people. To keep this inspiration going, we'd like to invite you to continue this conversation and join us at the Digital GLF Africa Conference on June 2nd and 3rd 
on restoring Africa's drylands, accelerating action on the ground. Register to attend on the GLF website. We'll see you there. My name is Rosario Perez, and it's been a pleasure and honor to be your host today. And this leaves me to say, I'm focused on maintaining hope and think landscape.